Are the backup running backs in Los Angeles going to continue to climb up the selection ladder? How likely will it be to see the left side of the board pound the wideouts early again this evening? And how many fascinating builds will we see from the drafters tonight? Follow along with the live draft board and listen to Pick by Pick live analysis as we call the action from the 2021 FFPC Pros versus Joes. Winners get to do what they want, league number six to see who's going to win that 2022 FFPC main event team. We've got a great show for you. Farrell Elliott is here. I'm Eric Balkman. Stick around. Your high-stakes fantasy football hour starts now. Broadcast live and heard around the world, you are now listening to the most entertaining hour of radio on the planet. Welcome to the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour, presented by MyFFPC.com, with your hosts, Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. The High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour is your home for analysis from the best players in the world. And now, because no one else was available, here's Eric Balkman and Farrell Elliott. Thank you so much, Rob, and greetings and salutations to all of the Balkaholics and Ferreliex tuning into this broadcast. Welcome into the latest episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour presented by MyFFPC.com. I am, as always, your slightly above average host, Eric Balkman. My co-host is the definitive commissioner of fantasy football, Farrell Elliott. Tonight, we have the fifth of six special episodes for you. It's the 2021, I beg your pardon, the sixth of six special episodes. Not that I wouldn't love to do one tomorrow, but this is it, people. Uh, the It's the pros versus Joes. Winners get to do what they want. League number six draft tonight. We're going to be covering for you for the next two hours. You can follow the draft board at youtube.com slash high stakes fantasy football. Shout out to the chat room right now. We already got a bunch of people in there taking in this draft. If you want to post your questions for tonight's drafters or for myself or Farrell or any of the callers, any of the guests we have on tonight, please feel free to do so. But you can also tweet at us at HSFF Hour, at Eric Balkman, at J. Farrell Elliott as well. Facebook.com slash High Stakes Fantasy Football uh, slash HSFF Hour is where to get a hold of us there. And please give us a call if you'd like, 347 426 3682. That's 347 Game Oba. You can also email the show at the inbox at High Stakes Fantasy Football at uh, gmail.com. Our producer and mutual friend Rob and our audio engineer Bryce working hard to getting us all those questions throughout the broadcast this evening. Farrell, it has been uh, quite a while um, since we have done this many live shows before. You have co-hosted the Pros vs. Joe's uh, uh, draft before, but this is the first time you've ever done six in a row. And i got to tell you, man, I don't think I've told you this off air. You're killing it with the analysis, man. Everybody's loving it, including me. Well, that's great, Balky. And I think tonight I might have hit my second wind. I got accused of playing favorites. Someone called in and said my analysis was subject to me playing favorites. So tonight, I did not even look at the script of our players that are with us. I know some of them who are in the room, but I don't know where they're drafting. And I'm going to refer to the team names as Team 1 through Team 12. But thank you for that, and I hope my analysis is spot on. Sometimes, after a long day, I'm looking for the right words to put together to express my thoughts about a player, and the words just won't come. This has been the longest of long days, but what a great way, you know, late at night, that's the time I like to shine. So here we go. Yeah, and, and here we go indeed. Farrell, plug your ears because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell the listeners where everybody's drafting tonight. Michael Cobb okay. is selecting first tonight. The longtime FFPC Joe is uh, having the first pick. Another guy, uh, pro tonight, but also a longtime FFPC player, Dan Williamson from Goat District. He's selecting two. Curtis Hirsch is selecting third tonight, followed by the pro John Paulson, appropriately 
from four for four is picking fourth tonight. Alex Palazzo, Spearmint Rhinos, we've had him on this podcast before. He's picking fifth tonight. Established the runs, Pat Foreman, right after him. Andrew Miller, another longtime FFPC player. Selecting seventh, followed by a guest we've had on a bunch of times on this program. It's Michael Nazareth from Fantasy Football Mastermind. Nick Thompson follows him, followed by Jeff Manns from Guru Elite, selecting 10th. Jetshada Jeraboon is now the FFPC Joe drafting 11th. And Curtis Patrick from Rotoviz, Ryan McDowell from Dynasty League Football are your final selections tonight uh, in the 12th spot, ladies and gentlemen. Um, let's get into the analysis right away, Farrell, as the first round is complete. Uh, no surprise from Michael Cobb here. He goes Christian McCaffrey. Dalvin Cook versus Travis Kelsey seems to be the decision that most of the drafters are weighing. Not all of them. We saw Ezekiel Elliott go second overall in a couple of these drafts already. Uh, Jeremy Brown and Bob Longbo selected him second overall in drafts. Uh, I believe it was draft number two and draft number four. Um, but Dalvin Cook is the pick for Dan Williamson tonight, followed by Travis Kelsey. Uh, Curtis Hirsch takes him there. Trio of running backs, Alvin Kamara to Paulson, Derek Henry to Bolazzo. Ezekiel Elliott will fall to the sixth spot tonight. He gets to be the first-round pick of Pat Thorman at the uh, 106 tonight. Darren Waller to Andrew Miller at the 107. Austin Eckler, at, and maybe I'm just because I've done so many of these, but I feel like he's been selected eighth in like every single one of the pros versus Joe's draft. He goes at eight again tonight. City Fantasy Football Mastermind, Michael Nazarick. Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams making an appearance in the first round tonight. Tyreek Hill at the 109, Devontae Adams at the 110. Saquon Barkley, the 11, has been a pretty popular spot for him. We can talk about the uh, ADP data for the FFPC for the best ball slim that we find over at FantasyMojo.com. Run by Darren Armani. Uh, if you are not playing in, or if you are playing in the FFPC and you do not have a subscription, I strongly encourage you to get a subscription in there, not just for drafting season, but the waiver wire bids that he releases on there are invaluable as we go through the season and manage these rosters. Uh, Darren Armani, the godfather of the pros versus Joe's competition as well. In any event, Saquon Barkley's average ADP over the last three days in this format is 111. He's been going at 111 in a bunch of these drafts already. Uh, we saw Jake Seeley take him at 111. We saw um, Evan Silva take him at 111 in the First draft of Pros versus Joes uh, last Sunday, and now he goes to 111 tonight to Jachada Jeraboom, the FFPC Joe. Jonathan Taylor wraps up the first round tonight for Patrick and McDowell as uh, he goes off the board at the 112. So, Farrell, let's let's uh, talk a little bit about the Devontae Adams pick. I think that's the, the standout pick from this round. This is a player uh, that was because of the unknown of Aaron Rodgers. And even, you know, up until today, I mean, we, we heard the news that he was going to report. We heard the news that, that a, a, a truce, or at least a temporary truce, had been uh, agreed upon between the Packers and Aaron Rodgers. For me, I still wanted to see him walk in today, and maybe the drafters <laughs> did as well, as he was not a first-round pick last night. He walks in today, saunters into 1265 Lombardi Avenue, and uh, reports to Packers to the Packers for training camp. And that's good enough for Jeff Manns, as he makes Devontae Adams the second receiver off the board uh, at the 110 tonight. Is this what we're going to see now going forward, Farrell? Devontae Adams as a locked-in uh, first-round receiver? Yeah, I think so, and Jeff Manns is the kind of drafter to put his stamp on a player like this, and I can appreciate that. I've had multiple people tell me, okay, Rodgers is back, but Adams won't produce what he produced last year. And I say, why? Why do you say that? Because if you look at the film, you see Adams making catches. He's, we, we talked about how Julio Jones is an unusual pass catcher, how his window is so wide, and he can make the quarterback look great. Well, you know, nobody has to make Aaron Rodgers look great, but Roger, uh, but uh, Adams can still get open, which, which is almost zero separation from the corner, but it looks like he's the corner never has an opportunity to uh, make a play on the ball. And, and you, you have to love that. When you talk about a quarterback and a receiver clicking, that that's what, you know, they make it look easy when the defense is still doing its job. And that's, that's what these two uh, do together. And I've always wondered what a saunter would look like, Balky. Was that, was that what Rodgers looked like, Balky? Was that a saunter? I guess it was. It, it, uh, yeah. The T-shirt, though, might have been a little much. T-shirt might have pushed it. Too 
Hi, sorry about that, everyone. Not sure what happened there, but I am back on, and we have a round two to talk about here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, to kick things off, it was Patrick and McDowell taking Stefan Diggs uh, at the 201 tonight, followed by George Kittle at the 202. Nick Chubb goes off the board at the 203 tonight to Jeff Manns from Guru Elite, followed by Aaron Jones to Nick Thompson, uh, as both Manns and Thompson start off receiver running back. Calvin Ridley to Michael Nazarick, followed by DeAndre Hopkins to Andrew Miller. A uh, bunch of running backs here go. Now, we, we normally see a lot of these guys go in the first half of the second round. We're seeing them fall a little bit tonight. Antonio Gibson uh, over to uh, Pat Foreman, followed by Najee Harris uh, to Alex Palazzo, Joe Mixon to John Paulson, and then Clyde Edwards-Alaire to Curtis Hirsch. Uh, you're looking at A.J. Brown to Dan Williamson and D.K. Metcalf uh, the final pick of the second round to Michael Cobb, that is Mino Brown. Um, I, I'm reminded of, I think it was last year um, with uh, the Revelations draft, I want to say. I think it was the Revelations draft. One of the, you know, basically the first uh, $150 classic leads that the FFPC has. Um, the Revelations draft, Dan Williamson, I think was selecting 112 um, and, uh, and um, he uh, ended up taking A.J. Brown in the first round. Um, and uh, and it, was, it was huge at the time. Like, nobody thought that this was going to happen, um, that, that Brown would be taken that early. But he was indeed, and, and it was a huge badge that Williamson wore pretty much all season. And, uh, and Williamson ended up going uh, with Brown there and, and was rewarded for it, I mean, for the most part, A.J. Brown with a big season. We do have uh, uh, Farrell Elliott back on right now. Farrell, not sure what happened there, but I think we are we are good to go. Am I coming through to you, man? You're coming in loud and clear, Balky. And when we start talking with Packers, and, and I start acting like I know something about the Packers, I probably should be cut off because you are the <laughs> definitive voice of the Packers. And I, I believe that was the airways, you know, to, putting me in my place. And and you know, I can I can live with that. Yeah, and, and speaking of the Packers, Aaron Jones went off the board here at the 204, so he's settling nicely into that early mm-hmm. second round, early to mid-second round pick uh, right now. At, you know, this is two drafts in after the whole um, Aaron uh, Rodgers stuff, uh, and, and I think that's where Jones is probably going to go. We're seeing Kittle consistently drafted either late first, early second. Uh, he goes tonight to Jerry Boone, the uh, FFPC Joe tonight. He gets uh, Kittle at the, uh, at, as the third tight end off the board. Um, other than that, nothing really stood out to me uh, with the first round. We could talk about Najee Harris, I guess, just briefly, Farrell. This is a guy that um, I guess, you know, some of these running backs, their ADP um, fluctuates quite a bit. And I think Harris mm-hmm. is one of those guys. I mean, we've seen him go um, as early. And by the way, I'm looking at the Mojo data right now. He's gone as early as the 105 in, in, a, in a format like this, um, the, the FFPC best ball slim. Uh, he's also gone as late as the 306 which is pretty insane. This is over the last three days. There's, it's a polarizing situation. Fresh offensive line, a lot of receivers there, but Harris is the number one uh, pick. He has an ADP uh, right now of 206. Where do you think he's going to end up as we get closer to Kentucky, as we get closer to, uh, to Vegas at Planet Hollywood, Farrell? In Kentucky, he's going to do very, very well because we have a huge Pittsburgh Steelers following. I know that's a national following, but it goes back generationally in in, in Louisville, something to do with uh, Johnny Unitas starting as a Steeler before he went on to fame. But uh, today, 2021, Najee Harris, uh, once we see him catch the ball and apply those jets out of the backfield, he's going to blow up that board. And we're not going to see a lot of him in the preseason, but we're going to see enough of him uh, for him to get comfortable, and we're going to see his place in this offensive unit. And we can only extrapolate it to what it will look like over four quarters because uh, we'll be limited to a few touches. But uh, they will look good, they will look impressive, and people will love it. Moving forward into the third round here tonight, Michael Cobb takes Justin Jefferson uh, as his second receiver at the 301. Uh, Dan Williamson gets Keenan Allen as his second receiver at the 302. C.D. Lamb off the board to Curtis Hirsch, his number one wideout uh, at the 303, followed by Terry McLaurin to John Paulson. Alex Palazzo becomes the only team tonight to start off with three straight running backs. He gets Henry in the first, the aforementioned Harris in the second, and now J.K. Dobbins in the third round. 
Kyle Pitts goes off the board once again as tight end four to Pat Thorman from Establish the Run. And then you have Allen Robinson to Andrew Miller, the pick after that. Bunch of running backs here, a trio, in fact. Michael Nazareth takes Chris Carson, DeAndre Swift at the 309 to Nick Thompson, and then Mike Davis off the board. Jeff Mann not messing around. He's manning up, taking Mike Davis at the 310, Patrick Mahomes at the 311, and Mark Andrews, the fifth tight end off the board tonight, the number one tight end for Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell at the 312. Farrell, the story to, to me, I, I guess, is as we look at Mike Davis tonight as the number two running back drafted by Jeff Mann, Mike Davis was a guy who slowly rose up draft boards, I guess, uh, after um, you know the Falcons didn't do anything in free agency besides Davis. They didn't do anything in the draft. And then he shot up quite a bit. Now, he still has an ADP of 507 right now. In fact, the earliest he's been selected in any of these drafts has been 407. So Jeff Mann's really reaching on Mike Davis here. Not really sure if um, if that's what I would have done, even if I was a believer in Mike Davis. But he went out and got his guy here, a guy that I don't think you're a fan of. Um, not not this high in the draft, and I've just yet to see it uh, in a prolific uh, in prolific examples and continuous. Excellent play. For instance, I don't think Davis is the guy that's going to put together three 100-yard games back-to-back. I don't think he's going to be that effective around the goal line. I don't think they'll let him be that effective. They're going to be working with this big tight end wherever they line him up, uh, as as well as uh, Ridley um, from the receiver position. So uh, Davis would not have been my pick there, and um, it's a real interesting uh, situation that's developing almost in every draft. You can rubber stamp it, Balky. Those wide receivers, four of them, excellent wide receivers, seem to be in these drafts uh, going a one through four as we make that two and three turn. And what excellent players they are. Jefferson, Allen, Lamb, McLaurin, my favorite of those, despite Jefferson's tremendous play last year, my favorite player of that group is Lamb, and I think team number three is, is on its way to a very – impressive build yeah i mean curtis hirsch gets the two chiefs right away and kelsey and and edwards lair and then cd lamb i mean really really explosive team there we'll tell you what he did in the fourth and fifth round shortly but let's get you through the entire fourth round dj moore to curtis patrick and ryan mcdowell julio jones off the board to uh to shot Jiraboom, who now has a running back a tight end a quarterback and a receiver the rainbow start out of the 11 column there Javante Williams, the rookie rusher, goes to Jeff Mann. So Jeff Mann has assembled a pretty strong backfield. Chubb, Davis, and Javante Williams to go with that Javante Adams pick in the first round. Amari Cooper to Nick Thompson, followed by Mike Evans off the board tonight at the 405 to Michael Mazurek. Miles Sanders will be the number one rusher for Andrew Miller, at least to start the season. Robert Woods to Pat Thorman for an established run, followed by uh, Chris Godwin, the number one receiver drafted by Alex Palazzo. Tight end six tonight is T.J. Hawkinson. He is now a member of John Paulson's four for four squad. And then Cooper Cup to Curtis Hirsch, Daryl Henderson to Dan Williamson, and David Montgomery completing the fourth round to Michael Cobb as his number two running back. Um, Farrell, the I think it was yesterday, and we didn't talk about this. At least I don't think we talked about it. Um, the news came out yesterday that Sean McVay said he was not going to play Daryl Henderson at all in the preseason. Um, it's weird to see a guy like Henderson get the Ladanian Tomlinson treatment, but I guess, and I don't know if you agree with me here, but maybe they almost have to because if Henderson were to go down in a meaningless game, well, then they're really, really in a bad place with that running game. Yeah, they're just like us in fantasy football. There's no one else available. You know, you're you're going to have to develop your own star. Can they find their James Robinson this year? I don't know if he's on the roster yet with those rookies that he has out there. I hope that uh, – um, what's our gentleman in the number five spot's name uh, last night? Uh, that's Alex Alex Belazzo. Belazzo. It, it's, I – this is a name that I've known for a while and he's a very good drafter. I hope he calls in tonight because I would like to ask him a question. If he had known that in the fourth round uh, that Henderson would be available and that uh, uh, Etienne would be still available and there's a running back that hasn't even been drafted yet that I like better than two of the guys that went in the fourth round, but I, I would be curious if he would have taken one of the elite wide receivers uh, Robinson was still on the board, 
uh, Cooper, Julio Jones, Moore, if he might have taken one of those guys and and would rather have switched it out with a with a higher uh, pick receiver and then one of the running backs that was still available. I don't think he ever thought that uh, those players would uh, would be available to him in the fourth round. And Sanderson hasn't been available uh, in the early Alex, drafts. Alex Galazzo, a, uh, a a player that we had on this on this uh, show roughly a month or so ago. Uh, Baker <laughs> to the stars out on the West Coast is Galazzo. We got <laughs> surprised on air that he was going to be playing in the pros versus Joe's this year for the first time ever. I know he's psyched for it, and he's loading up on volume at running back to try to win that 2022 FFPC main event squad. As a reminder, this is a slim format FFPC starting lineup. Quarterback, two running backs, two receivers, tight end, two flexes, no kickers, no defenses, no excuses. You are looking at um, one team here. You don't know which one it will be until the end of the year, but one of these teams, whoever wins this league, will be awarded a 2022 FFPC main event squad at the value of $1,900. Second place doesn't get you anything. And we've seen as these drafts have progressed on over the last two weeks that there are a lot of home run swings out there, stuff that you don't normally see in maybe a double-up draft or maybe a closed 12-team league. I think you'll see some home run swings in the inaugural best ball tournament that the FFPC has going on right now. And you're plucking down $125 to win $100,000. Yeah, you want to be different. You want to take some, some big cuts, some big long swings at those pitches coming in. Uh, and in this format, I think you have to do it, too. It's sort of a microcosm. Of, uh, of that best ball tournament. Let's move forward here and talk about the fifth round. Farrell, you mentioned Travis Etienne. Michael Cobb made him the first pick of the fifth round. Trio of receivers after that. Dan Williamson locks up his number three receiver in the name of Tyler Lockett. Jamar Chase, the rookie uh, for Cincinnati, joining Curtis Hirsch's squad. This is uh, looking like a, a pretty interesting one. It's getting some some love in the, uh, I believe in, I, I thought I saw, I can't remember which chat it was, but it was the BTR chat or the YouTube chat right now, but that's getting some love. Deontay Johnson is the number two receiver now for John Paulson. The quarterback's starting to come off the board. After Patrick Mahomes went at the 311, we didn't see another quarterback drafted until now. At the 505, Alex Palazzo takes Josh Allen. Adam Thielen joins Robert Woods as the lone receivers on Pat Thorman's squad from the sixth spot. Kyler Murray off the board to Andrew Miller. Miles Gaskin to Michael Nazareth, and then Dak Prescott, to Nick Thompson at the 509. You're seeing Kareem Hunt go off the board here to Jeff Mans. He is loading up on running backs. Four straight running backs here in rounds two through five, loving that volume that he is getting there. So he gets Kareem Hunt as the 25th running back off the board. So he has four top 25 running backs on this squad. We'll see how he fills in the cracks as we move to the uh, last two-thirds of this draft here, going into the sixth round right now. Uh, Odell Beckham, the number two receiver for uh, Jerry Boone, the FFPC Joe in the 11th spot. And then Lamar Jackson completes the 12th, uh, the sixth round, uh, the fifth round, beg your pardon, with the final pick. That is Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell getting the hook up there as they took Mark Andrews in the third, Lamar Jackson now in the fifth. One of the things that I don't think we've talked about through all these drafts, Farrell, is something that Dave and I have talked about uh, when we did the live draft coverage of Pro Zers, this show, the Football Guys Players Championship. Genesis, Revelations, the list goes on. Dave was always of the opinion that it's very difficult to have a, an extremely successful team when you go with an early quarterback and an early tight end. Um, you can go one or the other and, and still fill in your running backs and receivers, but it's difficult. You're kind of putting yourself behind the eight ball to get both of them. Andrew Miller drafted Darren Waller in the first. He drafted Kyler Murray in the fifth. So he has the third quarterback off the board the second tight end off the board. Jetshada uh, Jeraboon in the 11th spot. George Kittle in the second. Patrick Mahomes in the third. Uh, and then you look at Patrick and McDowell's squad. Mark Andrews in the third. Lamar Jackson in the fifth. Do you think because of the slim format, only 18 players on these rosters, we can throw caution to win and not necessarily follow that rule? Can you get away with an early quarterback and an early tight end in this format? Yes, I think that's old school thinking, and you can get away with it more often when everyone does it, and when you have tight ends that are separating themselves in obvious uh, tiers uh, from the run-of-the-mill tight ends in, in the league. You know, we've 
when you're looking at the opportunities of uh, the continuance of Kelsey's dominance as a tight end, when you think about Waller, and I keep predicting that he will have even a better year, and what Atlanta is doing with Pitts, and uh, the continuation of the maturity of Hawkinson, um, people don't seem to be bothered that uh, uh, Jerry Goff is headed his way. He's a strong player. And then you realize that Andrews, gets all the targets in Baltimore. And then we were, the fifth round rolls around, and that's where all the quarterbacks go. Mahomes goes earlier, and then the quarterbacks start running off in the fifth round. They're, they're top elite uh, running backs that can beat you uh, with their arm and with their feet. So, yeah, I think that's old-school thinking. I, I, I don't think you should hesitate with, uh, you know, the way you build your team should include tight ends in our tight end premium format. And this is the the best way to get one of these exciting uh, quarterbacks. I'm not saying I would do it, but when Josh Allen's there and I'm in the fifth round and I can't get excited about who I uh, want to pick, Josh Allen, it's real, real easy to push that button or to call out his name. And, you know, Balky, additionally, as we look at this fifth round with all these running backs going off, I had to take a little bit of a sidebar here for a moment. You get some interesting responses when you Google did Josh Jacobs get run over by a bus today? Uh, that That's what I was trying to figure out. And there's a whole lot of interesting stuff here. There's some pictures of buses. If you click on images, there's Josh Jacobs riding a bike. But, no, apparently he didn't. But um, So, you know, there's, a, there's one of the better running backs that uh, not getting a lot of love uh, with, with several guys in front of him that I don't think should be. Let's talk about that round here shortly. By the way, I want to uh, give a shout-out to Shane Hallen, who actually drafted – Shane P. Hallen, beg your pardon, who drafted in the uh, Sunday night uh, draft of week one. He's pointing out there's a lot of stacking going on in this draft right now. We already told you about Patrick and McDowell getting Jackson and Andrews, but you're also looking at a Kyler Murray, DeAndre Hopkins hookup for Andrew Miller in the seventh spot. You're looking at a Dak Prescott. Amari Cooper uh, um, uh, stack in uh, in the nine slot with the FFPC Joe Nick Thompson. So we're seeing a lot of it here. We may see more as more quarterbacks go off the board. So far through six rounds, only six of them off the board. One of them went in the sixth round. We're going to tell you who it is right now. Uh, as we begin the sixth round, after the Lamar Jackson pick at 512, Patrick and McDowell take T. Higgins as their number three wide receiver. Chase Edmonds off the board as the number two Receive a uh, running back, beg your pardon, for Jeraboon there, the FFPC Joe drafting from the 11 hole. Noah Fant is Jeff Mann's selection in the sixth round. Does not draft five straight running backs. He gets Fant as his number one tight end there. The aforementioned Josh Jacobs to Nick Thompson. I'll tell you about him in a second. Uh, he, uh, Nick Thompson gets Josh Jacobs at the 604 tonight as his number three running back to go along with Aaron Jones and DeAndre Swift. Aaron Rodgers moves up around from where he was last night. He goes at tonight at the 6.05 to Michael Nazareth from Fantasy Football Mastermind. Brandon Ayuk, perhaps a guy that uh, Rodgers was hoping the Packers were going to get last year, goes a spot after him. Andrew Miller grabs the San Francisco sophomore Ayuk as wide receiver 26. Kenny Galladay to Pat Thorman from Establish the Run, followed by Trey Sermon right after that as the number four running back drafted by Alex Belazzo. You're looking at Chase Claypool and Juju Smith-Schuster, two real-life teammates that go back-to-back tonight. John Paulson takes Claypool. Curtis Hirsch takes Juju Smith-Schuster. Jerry Judy off the board to Dan Williamson with the penultimate pick of the sixth round. And Dallas Goddard at 6'12 as the eighth tight end selected, the second tight end selected in the sixth round. So let's talk about the Josh Jacobs pick here. Farrell already told you that um, he was Googling, uh, did Josh Jacobs get hit by a bus? Certainly interesting stuff that we do while we're bringing these, uh, these podcasts to you, ladies and gentlemen. But this is the kind of uh, hijinks that ensue when Farrell and I get together and cover a live draft. Josh Jacobs normally running back 20 with an ADP of 411. The earliest he's gone in the last three days, the 212, the latest he's gone, the 605. Tonight he goes at the 604. I'm not sure what happened. I totally get why Jeff Manns wouldn't take him. But when you have an opportunity um, like Jared Boone or Patrick and McDowell to grab Josh Jacobs in the fifth round as your number two running back, not sure how both of them passed up um, uh, on uh, Jacobs, not once but twice as uh, they let him go in the sixth round as well. Farrell, I'm scratching my head here. 
Uh, a lot of people feel that this is a mediocre offense and he's going to share time with Drake and uh, that uh, perhaps he will not get the goal line. And, uh, you know, there's just – it's just not a love for a lot of players. They need to go back uh, – a lot of love to this player. And, and drafters need to go back and look at the um, look at the game logs and, and how they use this player. And you can imagine if the Raiders uh, can actually get ahead in some games and they have to salt away some leads and he can actually get to run the ball in the third and fourth quarter. Um, I think that uh, this player is in for a, an improved season. And, he, and he's being drafted – Nowhere near well, what he was last year, and this is a steal in the sixth round. And uh, I congratulate Team Number Nine uh, for putting this player uh, with his other two running backs, Jones and Swift. Uh, he's he's also a very good start here with uh, Hill and Cooper as his wide receivers. And you know, with something is, that falls to you like that, you have to have a big smile on your face when you draft Josh Jacobs in the sixth round. We have a big smile on our faces right now because we are about to welcome in the 14-time FSPC and Football Guys League champ, the Baker to the Stars out uh, in, in California, the former guest of this show and a guy that Farrell was hoping would call in. He's here, ladies and gentlemen, making his pros versus Joe's debut. Alex Galazzo, welcome back to the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour, man. How you doing tonight? What's up, boys? This is a shit show, bro. This is a hard draft. <laughs> <laughs> But you've been, Alex, you've been in some tough, yeah. tough, you've been in some tough football guys and main event drafts before. This one's a bloodbath for you. This is true. You know, I mean, it, it's every once in a while, like even in the hard drafts, you know, you kind of get a couple guys falling. But I, like I've been sniped like three times already. The guy right next to me. I mean, it's there's, there's. I agree with you, Fer. Like if I'd have known that I could have got even. David Montgomery in the fourth round. I wouldn't have taken Dobbins in the third. I would have taken Allen Robinson, right? I would have been fine with that. Sure. But David Montgomery, I saw him go in the second round last night. So I'm like, there's no way I get a guy coming back. I'm not sure on Henderson yet. I mean, I was even thinking taking Jacobs in round and passing on Allen. But at that point, I'm like, you know what? Forget it. I, 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 with, with the start I have without any really super high wide receivers, I wanted to get a great quarterback who I think, like I told you guys on the show, could get be an MVP candidate. So I figured he 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 can make up a little bit if I can average twenty eight points a game with him. I, I just need Godwin and and now Chenault in, in the seventh to give me something to to carry it out. Would you have what, taken Galladay in the sixth if he had come your way? Oh, for sure. I, I had I had Ayuk and Galladay primed, and they both got picked before Sermon. So I would have taken yeah. both of those two guys as my two, okay. but they both went, and then it was either Claypool or Sermon, right? And so I was like, you know what, at this point, with the way this is going, I'm taking Sermon's upside at this point, you know, because I figure, look, you know, it, it, in a best ball, if he if he takes the lead lead back role at some point, you know, in the middle of the season, I, I think he can have an absolute monster year on that team. It, it, the if, so I'm taking that upside there over the rest of those wide receivers and seeing if I can get, like, Chenault or – Someone in the uh, in the in the seventh, and I end up getting Chenault in the seventh, a little early, but I'll take him as a number two, thinking that Sermon Sermon's the hook here. If he if he has the season I, I want him, I, we, I really want think he can have, then I'm fine. Quick question: uh, Alex, Would you have taken Claypool? There's there's no bigger upside than Claypool. You must, if you listen to the show, you must know there's no bigger upside <laughs> yeah. than Claypool. If you, if you sure. could have taken Claypool there, could you have then taken Mostert? in the seventh round and lived happily ever after. No, I'm not a Mostert dude. I, I like Mostert, but he's okay. always dinged up. Fair enough. He's going to start a couple games, but I would have, I mean, I had no problem going Godwin, Claypool, you know, and then Chenault, right? I, it, it really, could, it was six, one, half a dozen, the other. I just think Sermon, I think Sermon's going to finish the second half of the year as the number one, and he's going to put up monster numbers. Uh, and so I just said, you know, and I think there's more upside there. And even though Claypool, you know, has a lot going on. I mean, he still has Deontay Johnson to deal with and Juju and now Najee Harris is on my team. And I'm like, do I really want two guys on that, on that Pittsburgh team? Cause who knows what's going to happen yeah. there. Mm-hmm. You know, he's my second, second back. So you're right, bro. Claypool has a monster upside, but like I said, shit show. This is a, this is a tough one. <laughs> well, okay. So when, when we're talking about that, Allison, the final question we got, we, I want to get to our next caller here. But uh, who, yeah. what was the bigger surprise for you tonight, Alex? Was it Mike Davis going off the board at the 310, or was it Josh Jacobs falling all the way to the 604? You know, Mike Davis at 310, for sure. I, Josh Jacobs is crazy in the sixth round. 
crazy. I, like I said, I almost took him in the fifth just on principle because I'm like, come on, dude, really? But but Davis at 310 is, is early. I mean, that's really early. I've seen – I mean, I, I think like end of the fourth or end of the fourth round is a little early for him. But third round, I'm a little surprised at that, especially when there was a Montgomery or, you know, a Sanders, even a Henderson over Davis, I think. I just – I just – there's not enough to go on there, but you know what I mean? Who knows, man? I, I think, I, I think that's too early for him, but whatever. Jacob's, Jacob's a little crazy, but that's the one that gets me. Well, we will see how your team ends up tonight, Alex. I certainly appreciate you calling in. Uh, congratulations on being selected and uh, good luck in all your leagues this year. We'll see you in Vegas, dude. All right, bros. Have a good one. Keep it up as always. You guys are, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Alex Belazzo, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, drafter coming out of the five hole tonight, a 14 time winner of the FFPC and football guys leagues. Uh, Good stuff from him. And we're going to get some more good stuff from our next caller, ladies and gentlemen. It is another uh, FFPC Joe calling in. And I believe he's on the clock right now. Nick Thompson, who are you taking in the eighth round, man? Hey, how's it going? I'm uh, my draft board is, is frozen again here. Uh, So let me, uh, let me, let me get back in. It keeps giving me this error. I can't uh I can't select anyone. My my draft queue is closed. And that's because you're trying to take enough. Josh Jacobs in the eighth. It doesn't get that good until you hit it. <laughs> that's just so annoying when that happens. Yes. Yeah, so uh I don't wanna I I think I wanna finish my my stack here, uh and take uh do we back up again? Are we backing up? Uh yeah, I I believe yeah, yep. We're gonna have a, a uh selection of uh Raheem Mostert uh instead of Tom Brady, I believe. So Mostert is gonna go off the board to yeah. Curtis Patrick and Brian McDowell here at the uh what is that, the eight oh yeah, the eight oh one. That is who Patrick and McDowell wanted. So that's why you were frozen. Yeah, you are um, and, and now we are we are rolling again here, Nick. Um uh, you had mentioned you you had mentioned uh, completing a stack here. What are you thinking um, as far as the uh, 804 goes now, my man? Yeah, I really like uh, finishing up the uh, the Dallas Cowboys here with Dak, Amari, uh, and Michael Gallup. So the double stack here. Mm. Wow, so that's lethal, man. It's lethal. Okay, so let me ask you this. Now that we know the pick is Gallup here at the 804, uh, Nick. The Cowboys were on pace for some legendary stuff, uh, at least offensively speaking, last year before Prescott went down. Is there any reason to believe that they're not just going to keep it rolling again this year? And quite frankly, maybe even being better now that C.D. Lamb has a year of experience under his belt? I think so. I mean, I think the biggest concern is just what you said. There are a lot of mouths to feed, right? C.D. Lamb, Zeke, uh, obviously uh, my two picks here, uh, Amari and um, and Gallup, but uh, I, I think the historic season would have continued. Um, the 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 division they play in is uh, is fairly weak, um, so you know they're always uh, always generally high scoring affairs, little defense played. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't see why they why they can't keep it up. I think the hey, key Nick, to uh, success me... is the is the defense, Bucky. The key here. Uh, if, if Dallas has to pass to stay in the game or catch up, if you look at the games they won with Dak last year, they were playing catch up. That's why he was throwing the ball all over the place. If they have to do that because of the poorest defense, uh, Zeke Valley doesn't have as great a year in Gallup. They're going to they're going to push to have three receivers each at a thousand yards. So I want to put a question: is, do, you, do you think Gallup and, and Bucky may be able to consult? Uh, Armani's mojo about this, but do you think Gallup would have been there in the ninth for you if you had waited? I don't think so. The other, uh, since he was already taken, the other I was considering was uh, Tyler Higby uh, to get a tight end on the board. But, um, you know, just looking, and I know this isn't, you know, always all drafts aren't the same, but, you know, last night he went uh, at the end of the eighth, uh, you know, mm-hmm. two nights ago. Let's see where he went. Uh, he went. Uh, one pick after two picks after my current pick, so he looks like he's going oh, in the eighth. I, guess not. I, I don't think he would have been there. Uh, no. Somebody would have snagged him, especially. Uh, I, I, let me pull up the draft board here, but my guess would be that a lot of those guys uh, who are going to pick twice again here. Uh, where's the draft board? There it is. Um, I mean, first guy already has four running backs, so he's definitely taking wide receivers. 
second pick. He's got yeah. five wide receivers. He's solid. So, I mean, the first first and fifth pick and probably seventh pick are both going to go or going to go wide receiver again. I I don't think he would have lasted. I was interested in, in Michael good. Thomas too, uh, especially knowing that he'll be well, not knowing, but hoping he'll be back for the second half. But I didn't want to didn't want to grab him until the ninth. But it looks like he went there at nine oh one. Nick, let me ask you this. Um, you had – so we, we obviously have been talking a lot of Packers uh, with the Aaron Rodgers stuff over the last, uh, you know, 24 to 48 hours or whatever. You had and, – and maybe I'm just reading too much into this. But you had the opportunity to take uh, the number one receiver tonight. You made it Tyreek Hill instead of Devontae Adams. But then in the second round, you did go with the Packer, not necessarily one of Aaron Rodgers' targets, but it's the workhorse running back, Aaron Jones. Am I reading into how you think this season might go for the Packers, that you're more of a believer in Aaron Jones than Devontae Adams? Or was it just simply, look, I wanted Tyreek Hill there, and Aaron Jones is the best player available in the second round? Uh, I think the latter is probably more accurate. Um, you know, I was – I was, it's a, I think it's a coin flip between Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams. I think uh, while Adams probably has uh, more weeks, you know, hovering between, you know, 18 and 30 – uh, sometimes uh, Tyreek will pop off for a nice little 40 or as uh, as Giannis calls it, a 50 piece. Um, so, uh, so, 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 so I've gone for those spike weeks. Um, and then, uh, and, and to be fair, um, I think was, a uh, yeah, I think, um, uh, oh gosh, who was there for me? Barkley was there for me. Uh, I, I think I've bought a little bit into the, uh, the fear mongering as it were. Uh, I'm, I'm not too keen on, on the recovery and, um, you know, although I hope he has a great season, I'm just you got to get your first round pick right. That's there's there's a lot of opportunity cost there. So and I and I felt like nobody better than Tyreek Hill, especially after last season. I mean, he saw an uptick in in, in targets, which you know if that continues, I mean, for him, the sky's the limit. Uh, the sky's the limit for you in this draft as well. We'll review your team at the end, but obviously the, the YouTube chatter has picked up. Loving your Prescott Cooper Gallup stack there. Um, and, and the, the free running, I mean, obviously getting Josh Jacobs in the sixth uh, is, is pretty insane stuff. So I think that uh, you have the, the makings of a very competitive team here. You're going to try to make it even more competitive here in the ninth round. You already have four receivers. You already have three running backs. You already have a quarterback here. Uh, Nick, are you thinking about uh, taking a tight end in this spot and, and making sure you get a, a top 11 guy here? Uh, I think so, although, um, again, let me look at my draft board. Um, Al, you are on the clock. I, I think the, the next three or four kind of off the board uh, are generally in the same vein for me. I'm trying to, to keep up. Um, and you have um, you have team 10, 11, and 12 all with the tight end already. I know. Um, that's, yeah, I, exactly. That's, that's, that's what I'm thinking. Um not that I'm trying to steer you anyway, Nick. I'm, I'm just <laughs> oh, yeah. making, making an observation on the board. <laughs> no. Huh. Fantastic peering into your head. I'm, I'm looking. <laughs> I, the pick is made. The pick has been made. And, and it is yes. a, a guy that, uh, that Mark Andrews says could be an absolute freak this year. It's his real-life teammate. Marquise Brown off the board here, Nick. What, what do you what do you make of Marquise Ooh. Brown this year? Are you, are you drinking the Andrews Kool Aid? Uh, I am drinking the Andrews Kool Aid, and I would have liked to get Andrews. Uh, I think in the fourth, but he was uh, he was snagged at the end of the third. So uh, definitely a believer in, in Baltimore, and um, you know he's got a couple years under his belt now, uh, as does Lamar Jackson. So I'm excited about that, and kind of as you said. Um, Oh, I took, took a second tight end there, Gesicki, although I didn't have him uh, as my number 11. So, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I think these next three to four, kind of I have them all, tight ends, I have them all in the same tier. So, um, you know, I'll be happy with uh, with whoever whoever drops. We are uh, always happy with, uh, with Nick Thompson when he uh, drops by to uh, talk about his team, talk about pros versus Joes, talk about – fantasy football in general. Nick, it was a pleasure having you on. I'm going to let you get back to it and prep for this 10th uh, round selection, which may or may not be a tight end. In any event, good luck the rest of the way in this draft, and good luck in all your leagues, including the FFPC main event this season, as you try to take down that half-million-dollar grand prize. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for uh, giving us a buzz tonight, man. We appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nick Thompson, ladies and gentlemen, drafting out of the nine hole tonight. Let's do our best to catch up here, Farrell. 
I'm going to do two rounds uh, just to catch the listeners up in case you don't have the draft board in front of you. We left off with uh, Dallas Goddard in the sixth. Uh, uh, Michael Cobb takes James Robinson at the 701. Robbie Anderson to Dan Williamson after that. Michael Carter is the second running back for Curtis Hirsch. Tyler Boyd is now the fourth receiver drafted by John Paulson. That was the 704 pick. Uh, Alex Velasco talked about taking LaVisca Chenault and in the seventh round tonight. Then you have Russell Wilson starting at quarterback for Pat Thorman. Damian Harris, again, creeping, creeping up. He goes at the 707 tonight to Andrew Miller as his number two running back. Logan Thomas, the number one tight end drafted by Michael Nazarick, and it is all receivers from here on out in the seventh. Cortland Sutton to Nick Thompson. DJ Chark to Jeff Vans. Mike Williams goes off the board at the 7-11 tonight to Dechata Jeraboon, and then you are looking at Devontae Smith as the final pick of the seventh round. A lot of receivers in that round. That was not the case in the eighth round, ladies and gentlemen. Raheem Mostert to Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell. Melvin Gordon as the number three running back for Jeraboon. Justin Herbert will be starting at quarterback for Jeff Manns as he makes him his selection at the 8.03 tonight, and then a bunch of receivers go off the board. Gallup, you heard that pick live on the air to Nick Thompson. Antonio Brown after that to Michael Nazarek. Debo Samuel and Brandon Cooks off the board to Andrew Miller and Pat Thorman, respectively. But that was it for receivers in this round. See a lot of quarterbacks, a lot of signal callers in the back half of the eighth round. First, it was Tyler Higby to Alex Bulazzo. Then Brian Tannehill, the number one quarterback drafted by John Paulson. Zach Moss is the uh, running back selected here in the eighth round as Hirsch goes back-to-back running backs, Michael Carter and Zach Moss in the seventh and eighth. Tom Brady to Dan Williamson and Jalen Hurts, the final quarterback and the final pick drafted in the eighth round tonight to Michael Cobb, right back where we started here. Farrell, I I feel like we've talked a lot about these players uh, so far. You know, obviously with with six rounds, you you tend to talk about players um, over and over and over again. Um, but one, I guess, player that we can we can talk a little bit about here uh, that that we haven't touched on uh, so far is Melvin Gordon. Melvin Gordon goes at the 8:02 tonight. This is um, he's really falling. I mean, there's a lot of separation between him and Javante Williams, who, by the way, went at the 4:03 tonight. Melvin Gordon, Farrell. I mean, is, is there still juice there? I mean, is there still fantasy worthiness? Because I guess if Javante Williams goes down. I mean, it's him or Mike Boone, and, and Gordon could be pretty successful there. How do you see the backfield split going in, in Denver between Williams and Gordon to start off the year? I, I really don't understand this. I think it's a committee split 50-50 right down the line. And, you know, we're, we're dealing with a player uh, that, that averaged uh, four and a half yards a carry last year. He caught 30 passes. Uh, committee backfields are nothing new for Gordon. You know, he, he was a – impressive fantasy contributor when he was in the same backfield with Eckler. Uh, Why can't he be a a big uh, contributor here on a team that may have to, despite these these wonderful receivers, may have to rely on a running back that that has experience uh, over the rookie running back. And, you know, I I think it's reasonable to consider Gordon – uh, in the sixth round, uh, the seventh round is, is is a wonderful find for him. Getting him in the eighth round, if you're searching for for upside, you're in, in a real good situation there. Uh, we had uh, talked about Michael Thomas. I know Henry Mudo, who's in the uh, YouTube. Actually, Henry Mudo's in both chats tonight, BTR and YouTube, and he was wondering where Michael Thomas would go tonight. That question was answered at the 901 pick as Michael Cobb takes Michael Thomas here at the 901. That is wide receiver 42. Just for reference's sake, I'll bring up uh, the mojo again on Michael Thomas as as far as his uh, ADP goes. Um, Over the last three days, you're looking at uh, Michael Thomas going, and why do I not have it up here Uh, again? Just horrible, horrible hosting. I need a producer, a real producer here. Michael Thomas, wide receiver 25 at the 510. Now, that's over the last three days, so we kind of knew about this news uh, with Thomas, pretty close to three days. Uh, he has slipped as late as the 9.08. He slips to the 9.01 tonight. A.J. Dillon to Dan Williamson after that, followed by Matthew Stafford, quarterback 12 tonight to Curtis Hirsch at the 9.03. Curtis Samuel goes to John Paulson, and then Michael Pittman, the 9.05 pick to Alex Palazzo. That's his number three receiver. Nice little value there when you talk about all the running backs he collected in the first six rounds. Pittman as your wide receiver three. Nice little consolation prize. 
Will Fuller right after that. That's the fifth receiver drafted by Pat Thorman. And then we see Ronald Jones go to Andrew Miller. Jalen Waddell to Michael Nazarick. And then you heard the Marquise Brown pick by Nick Thompson right on these airwaves. Mike Yasicki off the board to Jeff Mance is his number two tight end. I believe he is the first team. Yeah, he's the first team tonight to back up his tight end. He took Noah Fant in the sixth. He gets Yasicki in the ninth. Corey Davis to uh, Jared Boone and then Joe Burrow completing the ninth round here tonight. Joe Burrow backing up Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell's fifth round pick of Lamar Jackson. They are the first team and only team. Oh, no, I misspoke. The first team to uh, back up their quarterback tonight, getting Jackson and Burrow. Let's move right on to the to the 10th round here, and, and we'll kind of tackle the 9th and 10th together here, Farrell. David Johnson at the uh, 10 one tonight to Patrick and McDowell. Irv Smith, um, so this is interesting. Nick Thompson wanted a tight end, um, and I was of the opinion that I, I didn't necessarily think that Manns, Jeroboon, or, or Patrick and McDowell would take a tight end since they already had him. Uh, in fact, Jared Boone and, and Patrick and McDowell used second and third round picks on their tight end. But they actually, um, Manns and, and um, Jared Boone both backed up their tight end. So uh, Evan Engram had to be the pick that Nick Thompson settled for as his starting tight end at the 10 4 Robert Tunyon, the Packer, goes off the board as the number two tight end for Michael Nazarick. Uh, then you're looking at uh, Jarvis Landry to Andrew Miller, James Conner to Pat Thorman, Russell Gage off the board to Alex Palazzo as his number four receiver. Tony Pollard goes to John Paulson at the 10-09. Devontae Parker, Leonard Fournette right after that to Hirsch and Williamson, respectively. Adam Troutman, the second tight end, drafted by Michael Cobb in the 10th round. It's kind of a loaded question, Farrell, but you know, with the FFPC tight end premium scoring, at what point do you sort of look at getting a second tight end? If you were in this draft, if you were uh, drafting – um, uh, uh, an FFPC pros versus Joe's best ball slim league. Let's just say you don't end up with Kelsey or Waller or Kittle. Uh, you, you don't get a top three tight end. At what point do you start looking at trying to grab a second tight end in this format? What round would you start looking at that at? Well, if I was Nick, I'd have to do it in the 11th round because when he picked uh, <laughs> when he picked Evan Ingram in the 10th, he really he he really disappointed me. I believe that that. Uh, when we get to that, uh, when we get to that eleventh round, there's a tie. Uh, four of them off the board in the tenth. I, I have a tight end I want to talk about in the eleventh, who who will outscore all of those guys uh, in in fantasy production this year. And and I believe that in this draft, uh, Higby, uh, who's been going exactly where he was drafted here, but I, I think we can project Higby to outscore two, if not three, of the guys that were drafted in front of him. So I'm going to be tempted, if this stays this way, I'm going to be tempted to, in FFPC redrafts, to draft as many as three tight ends because I feel with the with the dual flex I can get great uh, advantage out of that. And I don't mind, uh, I certainly don't mind uh, not paying as much as I think they're worth. So I can't say when I would actually start doing it, but I would leave valued uh, wide receivers, uh, good running backs that I believe might have successful seasons to pick some of the tight ends that I just mentioned, including the one we're going to talk about in the 11th round. We will talk about that tight end in the 11th shortly, but I want to go back out to the phone line. Let's hear from one of the mayors of the GOAT district, the overhyped sleeper himself, drafting out of the two-hole tonight. It's Dan Williamson. Dan, welcome into the program, man. Hey, thanks, Balky. Nice to be here. Appreciate the invite. Absolutely. How do you think your, your draft has fallen together after we're 11 rounds deep into this? I mean, so far I like everything other than where I lost internet and uh, I lost Michael Carter as a result. But you know, that's that's the way it goes. It it does go that way sometimes for sure. Was Daryl Henderson a priority for you tonight? I mean, you get him at the four eleven. Farrell and I have been saying he's he's been going too late. You make him a, a selection where we think he's more likely to go. How much of a priority was Henderson for you? Yeah, he turned into a pretty big priority for me there. I mean, when you're getting him at, at running back 21, and he sure looks like he's going to be the lead back uh, for the Rams, uh, that's a pretty valuable role. So if he can hold on to it, uh, that's that's going to do me real well right there. 
Uh, you obviously load up on receiver early. You, you're sans tight end right now as we head into the 12th round. Yeah, I mean, you've drafted a ton of FFPC leagues over the year. Do you think people are overvaluing the position? Because clearly it was not a priority for you with this uh, roster construction. Yeah, this this year I think it, either you get them early or you get them late. But I I haven't really been too interested in the guys in the middle. Um, you know, I and, and especially with the best ball where I can you know double or triple up and I can you know just take the best score every week. I don't have to worry about who to put in a starting lineup. It makes it a lot easier to just kind of you know punt tight end down the road a little bit. Well, Dan, I know you said you lost internet connectivity. I'm going to tell you, it's getting late, buddy. It's, uh, you know, when it comes to that tight end, I I think it's getting late. That's all I'm going to say. It it is getting late, but I got my eye on a couple guys here that I think are going to turn things right around for me on uh, the tight end front. So I'll be all right. You're going 12 and 30. You're going on the turn with tight ends. I I want to see this. And I'm wondering if one of them plays in New England. You're wondering if one of them what? I'm wondering if one of them plays at New England. Well, it depends. He's a New England Patriot. <laughs> it's it's quite possible. <laughs> who <laughs> who knows who will be left to me at that point? There. So. From the overhyped sleeper. Hey, Dan, um, uh, are you, I assume the Goat District podcast is uh, is broadcasting this, this draft live tonight. Have you tuned in? Have you listened? Are the guys frying your, your picks right now? What are they saying? Uh, we're not broadcasting this one live. I figured I'd let, uh, I'd let you and Farrell carry the water on this one, and I'd just ah. sit back and fall in, so. Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just out here enjoying the draft, and uh, you know they do have a live link, so they're they're keeping up with me. But uh, uh, people it, are loving your people are loving your your Justin Fields pick there in the 11th round in the chat rooms right now, Dan. Uh, as as we press on forward, your um, tell us a little bit more about when the Goat District podcast when what when you guys have your next one uh, coming out. I assume one of these podcasts coming up. We're going to have a recap and and, uh, and your thoughts on how you built this team, what went right, what didn't go right, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we're actually yeah. going to be broadcasting tomorrow night um, about probably 8.15 Central, uh, 9.15 to uh, yeah. Yeah. right coasters. <laughs> and, and I think I'm about to make Farrell pretty happy here. Uh, here we go. The, the 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 pick is in, and it is indeed New England Patriots tight end Hunter Henry. Uh, he tried to play Good. coy, we saw right through it, and Dan Williamson gets his man Hunter Henry here at the uh, penultimate pick of the of the twelfth round. Dan, would you go right back to the tight end well here in the thirteenth? I certainly am hoping to. Uh, we'll we'll see what uh, <laughs> what Kurt Brown yeah, does Michael, here, but uh, yeah, Michael well, Cobb. Uh, um, Looking at looking at his squad, um, he's up right now with the final pick of the 12th round. He does have two tight ends on his roster. I'm, I'm looking at Dallas Goddard for him in the sixth. He grabbed Adam Troutman in the 10th. Um, he did not go tight end with the final pick of the 12th round. It's the rookie receiver from New York, Elijah Moore. Um, and now he's on the clock at the 1301, putting Dan Williamson on deck, hoping that his guy falls to him. But if he's not, Dan's a seasoned high-stakes player. He's already got somebody else in the holster ready to go. And that's really important, too, when, when we talk about high-stakes drafting, Dan. You know, just getting sniped, that happens every draft. You just got to get used to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, if, if you don't have two or three places you can go with every pick, you're in trouble. And especially uh, for me, when I'm coming around the horn uh, and I have two picks back-to-back, I've got to have several picks holstered up uh, when I'm ready to make mine. But right now, we're going to go with a – a former New England tight end, and the hookup with Tom Brady. Ah, so now we're looking at Rob <laughs> Gronkowski here going off the board. There you, you go. You heard it here first at the 1302. So Williamson, despite not taking a tight end uh, through the first 11 rounds, ends up with Henry and Gronkowski. Excellent work to you, sir. And good luck the rest of the way. We all follow you on Twitter, at Overhyped Sleeper, the final E missing from Sleeper, and, of course, the co-host, of the Goat District podcast. A.J. Brown's number one fan. We're a big fan of Dan Williamson on this show as well. Dan, good luck the rest of the way. We'll see you in Vegas, and, and uh, hopefully you can take down that FFPC main event this year. 
Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Balky. I uh, really appreciate you guys having me on, and uh, great broadcast so far. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Dan. We definitely appreciate that. We appreciate you making not one, but two picks on the air, stuff you only get here. I was doing the whole Twitter thing, Farrell, back in the, you know, the days when the NFL draft, all the picks would be leaked on Twitter. I was leaking it out before it was even on the board, before it was even on YouTube yet, and I, I feel a little bit bad about that. But at the same time, we did it for two two picks, so who cares? Good stuff from Dan Moore. Yeah. I always love talking to him, uh, for sure. Um, the 11th round, Farrell, I'm not going to I, – I'll, I'll just motor right through it, actually, uh, because I know okay. you want to talk about one of the tight ends here. Kenyon Drake um, went off the board to Michael Cobb with the, uh, with the 1101 pick. Williamson then took Justin Fields. Gerald Everett at the 1103. Latavius Murray goes off the board to John Paulson, followed by Gus Edwards to Alex Velasco. Darnell Mooney is the number six receiver drafted by Pat Thorman. And then you're looking at Trey Lance, Naheem Hines, and Trevor Lawrence to Miller, Nazareth, and Thompson in the middle there, followed by Henry Ruggs to Jeff Manns. Jamal Williams is the fourth running back drafted by Jachada Jiraboon, and then Janu Smith off the board to Patrick and McDowell, the final pick of the 11th round. Farrell, there's only two tight ends drafted in the 11th round. I'm guessing you want to talk about Everett and not Janu Smith here. I'll talk about Everett because everyone wants to talk about Janu Smith, and they think they know what they're getting in New England. And I'll say only time will tell. that Gerald Everett will be something new uh, for the Seattle Seahawks and something with all the weapons Russell Wilson has had. He's never had any tight end other than tight end by committee. This is going to be a significant target for Russell Wilson. Everett plays in a way that, hey, look who drafted him, the number three team that also has Travis Kelsey. He plays very similar role as to the Travis Kelsey, as to the Darren Waller. I project this kind of player who's going up the road, up the coast, with his offensive coordinator, he was the first free agent that came in to uh, Seattle and signed was the first move that they made um, uh, when uh, uh, Shane Waldron took the job uh, there in Seattle. Now, if if I had been uh, our last caller, I would have looked at this and said, I could get Gerald Everett. I have Tom Brady. Do I really think that Justin Fields is ever going to outscore Tom Brady in this format? And I don't necessarily think he is. I would have taken Everett here and lived with another quarterback another day. He recovered very nicely with uh, with Gronk, who in this uh, who in this format is is a player to be reckoned with. I'm very positive on Henry, but uh, I don't understand. Uh, uh, well. I do understand what's going to happen when Everett gets into the field this preseason, and I hope grafters continue to wait until the double digits to take him because that will be wonderful for me. It is uh, wonderful to take another phone call. Now, if you're listening to this broadcast tonight and you're hearing all the guests we have on, you might think, like, oh, man, only the FFPC high-stakes guys are on. No, that's not necessarily the case. We have pros join the show, and we're going to welcome one on right now. He's the director of forecasting over at 4 for 4 Football, the most accurate fantasy pro uh, winner in both 2010 and 2014, top six accuracy in nine of the last 11 years. You follow him on Twitter, at 4 for 4 underscore John, and check out all his work at 4 for 4com He is doing some work from the four hole tonight. It's John Paulson. John, thanks for giving us a buzz. How do you, How is the draft going tonight for you uh, from that four spot? You know, I'm, I've been pretty happy with it. I like I like hearing the other guys call and call it a shit show because I've been pretty happy with my draft. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't been a shit show for you, man. It's been pretty good. Um, so you start off running back, running back, Kamara and Nixon. Did you have a plan of, of positions going in, John, that, that you wanted to target these high-volume running backs early, or was it, it, was it the way the board fell to you? No, I was uh, considering uh, Kelsey. I had him over uh, – uh, Kamara there at, at four and he went ahead of me. So Kamara was my fourth option at that spot. And then coming back, I would have gone Ridley potentially, uh, but I was looking at that tier of uh, running backs and was happy to get Mixon since he should ha- see a quite a big uh, workload this season. So it wasn't a plan to go running back, running back. It just sort of happened that way. 
I think um, TJ Hawkinson has been kind of a polarizing tight end this year. Um, for me, I'm on board with Hawkinson, but I know some of the other people will say, well, look, it's Jared Goff at quarterback there, not Matthew Stafford anymore. How good is that offense going to be? How many drives are they going to be able to string together? Tell us why Hawkinson is, is still a good pick for you, the sixth tight end off the board in your fourth round selection tonight. Yeah, at, at 4.09, uh, I was looking at potentially Mark Andrews slipping to me, looking at the ADP. So I didn't think Hawkinson would make it to me. And when he was there, I was pretty happy to get him. Uh, obviously, everybody knows that the, the Lions lost a ton of pass catchers and a lot of vacated targets there. And I think Hawkinson will get his share. And maybe the, the Lions don't you know, score as many touchdowns as some of the other teams um, out there, You know, maybe any of them. <laughs> But uh, he should see a ton of, uh, of targets and volume in that offense. And I think the touchdowns that do score uh, pretty high percentage of them should go to, should go to him because he's good around the, the goal line. Great stacking John. of those Pittsburgh Steeler uh, wide receivers. When you were in the sixth round and it came up, first of all, when the drafts were before you went running back, uh, you had to be pleased that you had your choice between Claypool and Schuster, was it a difficult decision of which one to pair with Johnson? And if Claypool hadn't been available, would you have gone Schuster? Uh, I can't remember if I would have gone Schuster there. I was had my eyes set on Claypool. I love his upside uh, in the sixth round. Um, and I don't mind taking a couple of receivers from the same team. I think you get some built-in floor. Smart. Uh, and and if, if something happens to Deontay uh, or Claypool, then the other guy gets – uh, a bump in value. So um, I don't have a problem. I mean, I, you know, I could, I could maybe stack uh, Roethlisberger here, but I'm not like planning on it. Uh, I've already got two uh, quarterbacks and I was pretty happy to get my uh, kind of backdoor uh, uh, stack with Fitzpatrick, uh, Curtis Samuel and uh, Terry McLaurin. So I'm feeling pretty good about the roster as a whole here. And I'm just a little annoyed that Anthony Berkser just went uh, in the 14th round. Cause I was hoping to stack him with, uh, with Tannehill. Talking with John Paulson from 4for4.com. John, I'm, I'm curious because you, you got Fitzpatrick there in, in the 13th round. Again, as you just said, you already had McLaurin, you already had Samuel. Was there any inkling, or perhaps there's going to be a future inkling here, um, to maybe get the quarterback for Pittsburgh, given that Deontay Johnson and Chase Claypool uh, you were your fifth and sixth round selection? Yeah, I mean, I thought about it, but I already had the, I had the McLaren Samuel as well. So, obviously, to me, the, the Fitzpatrick stack is more important. And I think Fitzpatrick has more upside as a quarterback because he does run the ball, whereas Roethlisberger is pretty uh, pocket central right now. And I don't know how run heavy they're going to go, but, you know, I do think that uh, Deontay and, and Claypool will get theirs. I could go with a three-quarterback stack here. I guess it sort of depends on who's available to me with my last few picks here because, I, you know, I, I, I don't always – set myself on a, a roster construction and I might decide that that stack gives me some, some upside when, uh, you know, things get into the, the final weeks. John, one of the players that uh, has been kind of interesting over the last, well, week or so is Traquan Smith um, with the news that Michael Thomas is, is going to miss some significant time in the 2021 regular season. Traquan Smith looks to be the number one receiver in New Orleans, but High stakes drafters, I mean, they, they haven't really, and, and even pros versus Joe's too, they haven't really pushed him up the boards as, as much as I thought he was going to be. How excited were you to get him in the 12th round? And, and sort of what do you project him as, as the director of forecasting for 4 for 4? What do you sort of project him as um, while Michael Thomas is out? How good is he going to be? Yeah, he was up there for the, the you know, at, on the my wide receiver rankings at that pick, and uh, it, that was kind of a tough pick. I was trying to decide amongst some different people, and I didn't know if I should take Fitzpatrick there to lock in my stacks because uh, the guys after me didn't all, both have uh, two quarterbacks. But I figured looking at Fitzpatrick's uh, ADP that uh, it was safe to go with another position there, and I think Smith, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very uh, bullish on Michael Thomas's injury or whether or not he's going to be back uh, sooner rather than later. So I'm expecting him to miss at least eight games, and it might be kind of ugly after that. Uh, so I think Traquan, when he's been called upon and when he has uh, played big snaps, he has uh, tended to produce, and I think he has a chance in that offense to, to be the top receiver. Obviously, I've got Kamara, who's really the top receiver, but I think Smith has a chance to, to produce as well. Yeah, important to note that, too, that just because when, when Michael Thomas, if he is indeed pumped and comes off, you know, week eight or week nine or whatever it is, uh, he's still got to get in football shape, and, and you don't know um, 
how he's going to react, you know, coming from behind the eight ball of being out for so long. Uh, just because he's activated doesn't necessarily he'll be capital letters, Michael Thomas. You have a pick coming up here, my friend, uh, John, as we move forward to the 1409. It looks like you are on deck here. Nope, now you're on the clock. Can you tell us who the selection is going to be? Yeah, I, uh, I'm looking at my options. I was kind of hoping Jared Cook would make it to me, and he got sniped. So I'm tight end is kind of a wasteland right now. I think I'm going to go with another Steeler, and I'm going to take uh, Eric Ebron here um, with my with my pick. The Washington football team and the Pittsburgh Steelers well represented for 4for4.com's John Paulson. John, we follow you on Twitter at 4 for 4 underscore John. We'll check out all your work at 4for4.com. Can you give the uh, the listeners tonight a little taste what the 4 for 4 subscribers are going to be treated to you, uh, are going to be treated to from you coming down the pike here? Oh, yeah, we've really uh, done a good job, and Josh Moore is the, the owner of 4 for 4 of, of really expanding the, the workforce there, and we have a ton of talented writers. Uh, we have a standard fantasy product. We've got a, a pro subscription, which gets you uh, – a live uh, draft tool, draft hero, and, and some other things. And we've got a DFS product, and now we've got a betting product. And we've got some, some great people on staff, really sharp minds, uh, providing that. And then, of course, you get uh, my award-winning uh, rankings when you, when you subscribe. And we've got great, great deals going on where you can get a free subscription or a very cheap subscription through Underdog or Prize Picks. So just check my Twitter feed for, for those deals. Uh, an award-winning um, forecaster, maybe putting together an award-winning draft tonight. We will find out at the end of the season. John, thanks so much for giving us a buzz tonight. We certainly appreciate you participating in this. Good luck the rest of the way. Good luck in all your leagues, and keep up all the great work at 4 for 4com Yeah, thanks for having me on, and great job with the broadcast today. Thank you so much, John. We certainly appreciate that. I, I give all the credit to Farrell. Farrell is, is – oh. I'm not even the – I'm not. I listen. It's not even a Batman and Robin scenario. I don't know what what you'd call us, but but whatever it is, Farrell is the lead. I'm just I'm just kind of the hanger on uh, to to wrangle him in every so often when he takes us on his journeys, which we love so much uh, on this program. Farrell, uh, always good to have you. As we are getting into the fifth round here, I'm going to try to catch you up on uh, on what happened in the twelfth uh, and and thirteenth. When I left off, I believe it was uh, was the um, uh, John o. Smith pick at the end of the 11th. Uh, it was Rondale Moore after that, the rookie from Arizona, followed by Alexander Madison. T.Y. Hilton is the number four receiver drafted by Jeff Manns. Uh, the third quarterback for Nick Thompson is indeed Matt Ryan. Kirk Cousins backing up Aaron Rodgers for Michael Nazarick. You're looking at Cole Komet and Blake Jarwin, tight end 18 and tight end 19 to Miller and Thorman, respectively. Gabriel Davis to uh, Alex Galasso. You heard Traquan Smith go to John Paulson. Jalen Rager after that to Curtis Hirsch. Hunter Henry, that pick was made live on the air by Dan Williamson, and then Elijah Moore to complete the 12th round. As we get into the 13th, it's Carson Wentz to Michael Cobb. It's Rob Gronkowski to Dan Williamson, another pick made live on the air and spoiled by yours truly. Emmanuel Sanders to Curtis Hirsch after that, and then a trio of quarterbacks. Ryan Fitzpatrick to Paulson, Baker Mayfield to Bolazzo, and Daniel Jones to Thorman here with the 1306 pick. James White to Andrew Miller. Then you have Marvin Jones going to Nazareth after that as his number five receiver. Devin Singletary joins Nick Thompson's backfield as his number four running back. Rashad Perriman, the fourth consecutive receiver drafted by Jeff Manns there. That is uh, now six in the stable. The wide receiver core for Guru Elite looking very strong here in the mid-rounds. You're looking at Nelson Aguilar and Rashad Bateman to complete the uh, 13th round tonight. Aguilar to Jared Boone and Rashad Bateman to um, Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell. It's a huge tight end round here, as you heard from John Paulson, who was hoping a tight end would fall to him. He did end up taking one. Here were some of the uh, picks that he did not get a chance to, to grab since they went off a few picks before he was on the clock. J.D. McKissick to Curtis Patrick, followed by Anthony Ferkser to Jachada Jeraboon. Paris Campbell, another receiver, joining Jeff Manza's squad. Austin Hooper and Jared Cook back-to-back to Thompson and Nazareth here in the, uh, at the 1404 and 1405. Christian Kirk is uh, Andrew Miller's selection there after that. Giovanni Bernard joins Pat Thorman's running back core with uh, that being the number four running back he selected. Philip Lindsay to Alex Belazzo. You heard the Eric Ebron pick to Paulson. Darrington Evans went off the board to Curtis Hirsch after that, followed by the rookie, 
from LSU, now in Carolina. That's Terrace Marshall. And uh, his real-life teammate, Chuba Hubbard, another rookie for Carolina, completes the 14th round to Michael Cobb. That is Nino Brown, as we now have reached the end of round 14. A lot of tight ends go off in this round. Farrell, I know you don't like Ferkser. I Quite frankly, I, I don't know who your favorite tight end would be in this round between Ferkser, Hooper, Cook, and Ebron. I'm guessing it's Jared Cook, though. You would guess correctly, Balky, and this because of the quarterback and uh, what will happen in the middle of the field with all those great targets uh, with the Chargers. There's one player I would like to talk about here that went later tonight than I, he did last night. You would have to check me on that to see if memory serves correct. And I take the focus to Team 5, who in the 12th round took uh, Gabriel Davis. And I'm a little concerned about the Buffalo situation with what they're going to let Gabriel Davis do with Emmanuel Sanders, who went later in the 13th. Uh, with Emmanuel Sanders there. But uh, the player that I wanted to to focus on, Marvin Jones, our our Team 5 passes on Jones here in the 12th, even though they have LaVisca Chenault. And then in the 13th, he passes on him again. And I just think that uh, that, uh, this player could have helped any team earlier, but especially Team 5, because there's a lot of guys that catch balls uh, there in Jacksonville, and you don't want to forget the fact that the top rookie running back, Travis Etienne, if you talk to anyone in Travis's camp, anyone who's uh, in business with Travis, uh, and you ask what Travis is doing, they'll say he's running a lot of routes. Yeah, he is, which to me would make James Robinson a little bit more likable too. If if Etienne is, is going to be, you know, handling a lot of receiving work, it's got to be some guy between the tackles and, and maybe it is Robinson. And bear in mind too, I think how terrible Jacksonville was last year. Robinson still put up some pretty stellar numbers for a running back. So he may continue to be undervalued, and he may continue to be a guy that the zero RB guys absolutely love. Um, I, I like him quite a bit, Farrell. I know you do, too. Uh, we pressed on here in the 15th round, um, now completed, and a player that has been in the, the headlines today after the Aaron Rodgers signing uh, is uh, Houston Texans receiver Randall Cobb. More on that, uh, Michael Cobb takes Randall Cobb here, no relation that I'm aware of, uh, at the 1501. <laughs> Hayden Hurst off the board is the number three tight end to Dan Williamson. Tua Tungavailoa goes to Curtis Hirsch, backing up Matthew Stafford on his squad. John Brown, old Smokey, goes to John Paulson at 4for4.com in the four spot. O.J. Howard to Alex Palazzo as his backup tight end. A.J. Green to Pat Thorman. Pat Thorman now has seven receivers. A.J. Green, the seventh of those. Brian Edwards, a sophomore receiver from Las Vegas. He goes to Andrew Miller here, followed by Rashad Penny. Um, So Penny and Carson do end up on the same team, and it is Michael Mazurek's fantasy football mastermind squad uh, as he completes that backfield at 15.08. Cole Beasley to Nick Thompson at 15.09. Kevin Coleman to Jeff Mann's squad. Jeff Mann's Ended up taking four of uh, rounds two through five were all running backs. He did not take another running back now until round 14, where he gets potential starter in Kevin Coleman for the New York Jets. Sterling Shepard to Jachada Jeraboon and then Jamison Crowder, another New York Jet, off the board to Patrick and McDowell. Let's talk about Randall Cobb. Farrell, I did not think this was going to happen when Trey Wingo was putting this out yesterday, that he was hearing that um, part of the concessions that the Packers were going to make would be trading for Randall Cobb. And I'm starting to believe it now because there's a lot of smart people, a lot of connected people saying it's going to happen. I guess we should have saw it coming uh, when Anthony Miller gets shipped from Chicago to Houston as maybe Cobb's replacement. And, um, and now it seems like Cobb, you know, all, all, the, all the tweets I'm seeing, it seems like he's going to be coming back to Green Bay. How good can he be as the presumptive number two receiver for Aaron Rodgers this year? Well, he's a product of the University of Kentucky, so he'll be a very, very good receiver. There's a lot of history <laughs> there, and he's a long way from – you know, you will ask people from around here. They'll say, oh, Randall Cobb's too old. Randall Cobb is through. And they think – and I always ask them, well, how old do you think he is? And I get some interesting answers back, 35, 36, 34. You know, Randall Cobb is 30 years old this year. We just lived with him so long here in Kentucky, as have you in Green Bay. And and he's got plenty of gas in the tank. What was this? Of You know, Balky, you're always tuned into the Twitterverse. What was this that Cooks was uh, 
uh, tweeting out today that he would he would come over there and help Randall Cobb pack or something. It seemed to be uh, uh, some ill will between both those receivers. Well, I see. I don't. I don't necessarily. I, I guess I saw the Cooks tweet, and I didn't necessarily took took it that way, or maybe I just didn't read it properly. But it was something like um, I, I thought it was more encouraging. Uh, you know, Brandon Cooks tweeted out, "You meet people and they become family right away." At our Cobb eighteen, go back home and set it off. So I just assumed that that he was um, upset that that you know this guy that he had gotten to know obviously in meetings uh-huh. and on the football field in the locker room that he really liked him, they got along, and now just, you know, they, they essentially spend one season together there, and now he's going to be gone. So I guess, I guess so that's often, how I took it. Well, as so often in life, Balky, I have been misinformed. i tell you what, you mentioned something, <laughs> though, that, that, I, uh, that I have been informed about, and it comes from our great friend uh, uh, Bobby Sangerman. Uh, Bobby and I have been talking about Miller. Uh, making the move down to Houston. Bobby found a stat. I think he got it over at Rotovis. And he says whenever Miller historically has been targeted five times in an NFL game, that he averages 12.5 fantasy points. And I found that to be enlightening of a player that Chicago has turned their back on last year. And I think there was more ill will in the locker room uh, than there was on the field for this player. I'm excited for him to get a, a fresh start. I'm a big, big fan. We haven't talked about it a lot, but I'm a big, big fan of David Culley uh, from Sparta, Tennessee. Went to a little school in Nashville called Vanderbilt. Um, I don't think people know him, but when they get to know him, I think they're going to really like what he does as a coach. And he's not going to take this team to the playoffs, but he's going to put this team on the field, and they are going to compete and they're going to surprisingly shut down some people. Of course, we know they will not shut down T. White Hill. You know, one other thing I do want to bring up regarding the Cobb thing and, and his age, um, it, it's interesting because I knew, I knew he had been in the league a long time, but I knew he wasn't that old. He came in to the NFL as one of the youngest players, maybe the youngest player drafted um, in, into the NFL draft back in, in 2011. He was actually only 20 years old when he was drafted. That's he right. turned 21 during training camp that year. He turns 31 in less than a month. But still, obviously, Aaron Rodgers um, believes he has some good football left in him. I don't know what this does for Amari Rodgers, Farrell. I feel like this might stunt his development a little bit in Green Bay. Uh, probably so. And uh, But, uh, you know, uh, the slow cook, bulky is always the best way to cook. That's true. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's get into the uh, 16th round here as it is now completed. Jacoby Myers goes off the board here uh, with the first pick of the 16th round at the uh, 1601. Obviously, that is the uh, first uh, pick of the 16th round. That's Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell. A couple of quarterbacks here, Derek Carr to Jared Boone, and then Watson to Mann. Zach Ertz, the number three tight end drafted by Nick Thompson here. Tariq Cohen goes off the board at the 1605 to Michael Nazareth. Taysom Hill, third quarterback drafted by Andrew Miller. And then a bunch of high upside running backs, a bunch of guys here that could prove to be pretty valuable if indeed the starter goes down. Leading the way is Xavier Jones for Pat Thorman's squad. Damian Williams to Alex Bellazzo. Then you have Devontae Booker off the board to John Paulson. Kenneth Gainwell to Curtis Hirsch. Marquez Valdez-Scantling, the new number three receiver for Green Bay, potentially. We'll see. Dan Williamson grabs him there. And then Ben Roethlisberger off the board to Michael Cobb here to complete the 16th round of action. Um, and, and I know, Farrell, we look at this. At, at, at round 16, and I think it's littered with players I don't necessarily like this year. Jacoby Myers, Taysom Hill, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, uh, and even Tariq Cohen to a certain extent. And I guess that's, that's where I want to talk a little bit about uh, with you here in the 16th round. You have David Montgomery, who went all-world at the end of the season last year. Um, Damian Williams is brought in to help out in the backfield. And we hear Matt Nagy, you know, twice now go out of his way to say, like, look, we, we want to get 20 touches a game or 20 carries a game uh, for David Montgomery. Tariq Cohen limping on the sideline with, after the knee injury. We saw him limping, uh, it, you know, had a, had a heavy wrap around his knee. I mean, what's the upside for Cohen this year, given what seems to be a lot of things working against him? Yeah, this is the only format where Cohen makes sense. And the way you break it down, Bucky, it, it would seem that, 
we could look other places. My favorite pick in this round would be Booker. I think he has some standalone value. And I can still understand throwing a, a dart at the Zach Ertz uh, pick. Uh, and, you know, a car never gets picked, so Team 11, thank you very much for putting car in the game. <laughs> and um, I, I don't – I don't understand why Taysom Hill and Trey Lance are on uh, the same team, but I do believe they're the same player. And so this drafter is uh, looking for something different at quarterback than I would be. You know, I, I, just regarding um, Trey Lance, um, he is a player uh, that we have seen go early in, in, in these drafts, mm-hmm. these pros versus Joe's drafts. Sometimes like the ninth round, the 10th the round, Kyle Shanahan was really effusive in saying that there is no quarterback competition. Jimmy Garoppolo is the guy. And then Trey Lance falls around to Andrew Miller. He goes in the mid-11th tonight instead of the mid-9th or mid-10th. Um, how much are you buying what Shanahan's selling? Do you believe that there is no quarterback competition or is Lance going to be a guy at some point this year to take over the reins in San Francisco? Well, no, I don't buy it. I, I don't buy the fact that a team with with big, big expectations is going to expect this this player to improve them uh, from six and ten to get them through the playoffs in that division. Now, I do believe he'll be on the field, and it's going to be a developmental situation. This is a seventeen week season. Towards the end of the season, I could see him getting a little play. Trey Lance needs to go where Taysom Hill is going in the draft. He won't do it because people insist to drafting in front of uh, Matt Ryan and Kirk Cousins and, and Carson Wentz, who is, who is in a tremendous offense with a, with a coach that's going to give him great opportunities to be successful. Uh, there's other players here. They can beat you uh, both with their arm and their feet. Uh, Trey Lance is not going to beat anybody because it's not going to have enough opportunity to do so. And while he's got all the athletic talent in the world, uh, seasoning is what's going to be most needed uh, for this player. So I don't get it. Uh, And, you know, I hope I'm wrong because seeing an exciting player uh, play for the 49ers with some of the skills that we're seeing across the league, uh, would make that team uh, multi-dimensional, and especially in that backfield would help some of the players that I really like out there. But uh, I think the coach is telling us the truth. Um, we're going to tell you the truth about what just happened in the uh, 17th round as we uh, wind down our live pick-by-pick coverage here. 17th round was led off by Amon Ross St. Brown to Michael Cobb, Samaje P. Ryan to Dan Williams, and Marquez Callaway to Curtis Hirsch. Mo Alley Cox, third tight end drafted by John Paulson. Bunch of receivers here uh, in the 17th round, and, and some ones that with, with a bit of upside, actually. Nico Collins mm-hmm. to Alex Palazzo, Alan Lazard to Pat Thorman. Sammy Watkins goes off to Andrew Miller, followed by Tyrell Williams to Michael Nazarick. Uh, Deami Brown, the final receiver of that little run there going to Nick Thompson. Sam Darnold is the third quarterback selected by Jeff Manns, followed by Malcolm Brown and Javian Hawkins to complete the 17th round. Brown is going to be the sixth running back drafted by Jerry Boone, and Javian Hawkins is the number five running back drafted by Patrick and McDowell here. 17th round, Farrell, what can you tell me about Marquez Callaway? Um, this is a player that we don't always normally see drafted in these 18 round slims, but he has been creeping up here in these pros versus Joe's drafts over the last three days. He should. If you go back and look at some of the film from last year, you'll see an impressive player that played well will be a, when, when they fed him the ball before he got injured and he could easily be a big contributor in this offense starting early. And if you contribute to this team, um, they're going to reward you. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I think this is as good a 17th pick as a lot of guys. I like the guys uh, here in the middle of the round a bit better. My favorite would be Tyrell Williams. Uh, mm-hmm. Sammy Watkins yep. can flash. And Nico Collins is probably the one with the, the most long season, full season upside. We, uh, we are into the final round of our live draft coverage here for Pros vs. Joe's. The uh, Pros vs. Joe's number seven. Still going on. That is a slow draft. 
Um, we'll see if we can bring some coverage of that draft uh, onto the HSFF hour here shortly. Um, not tonight, but maybe in a future show. Uh, stay tuned on that one. Let's tell you what, how this draft ended up here, um, as we see a lot of purple and a lot of red here in the final round. Dalton Schultz to Curtis Patrick and Ryan McDowell. Jared Goff, the number three quarterback selected by Jetshada Jared Boone. Denzel Mims off the board to Jeff Manns as he continues to, or he completes his draft loading up on receivers. That is his number eight uh, receiver. Speaking of loading up, Nick Thompson went with four tight ends tonight after he didn't draft one until the 10th round. Got uh, a lot of ones to choose from here. Dawson Knox being the final one there. Zach Wilson, third quarterback for Michael Nazareth. Daryl Williams to Andrew Miller. Deshaun Jackson, the new Ram, is now a new member of EstablishTheRun.com's Pat Thorman squad. Dan Arnold, the third tight end drafted by Alex Belazzo. Jameis Winston joins Ryan Tannehill and Ryan Fitzpatrick in the quarterback room for John Paulson's 4for4.com squad. Dan Jefferson, the second Rams receiver drafted here in the final round. He goes to Curtis Hirsch. Dwayne Eskridge, Farrell's buddy, uh, goes as the penultimate pick of this uh, draft to Dan Williamson. And C.J. Uzuma, the guy that we talked about, did not get drafted last night. He has not met with the same fate tonight as he is Mr. Irrelevant going to Michael Cobb with the final pick of the draft. And as long as we're talking about Michael Cobb, Farrell, let's talk about Michael Cobb's team from the one spot. Quarterbacks ended up being Jalen Hurts, Carson Wentz, and Ben Roethlisberger. The uh, running backs, Christian McCaffrey, David Montgomery, Travis Etienne, James Robinson, Kenyon Drake, Chuba Hubbard. Receivers, DK Metcalf, Justin Jefferson, Michael Thomas, Elijah Moore, Randall Cobb, Amon Ross St. Brown. Tight ends, Dallas Goddard, Adam Troutman, and C.J. Uzuma. So I love the tight ends. I know you definitely do not uh, like the quarterbacks on this squad. I think he did a pretty good job at running back. But, you know, you look at the, the receiver position. Metcalf and Jefferson, awesome. But Michael Thomas is his three. A rookie in Elijah Moore is his uh, number four. You do have Cobb and, and St. Brown late with some upside but I think that's the weak spot on this team. I, I really like the squad, just not a fan of the wide receiver depth. He got in a little trouble there. This is an interesting draft for me because after the first three players, it appears that every other player uh, is, is either feast or famine for me. And, and, and until he got into double digits, which I began to like a lot of these players, but I think he did. I think he added some of them at the expense of wide receiver. A, a Troutman, I've, um, the jury's out. On Troutman for me, and here Troutman goes above uh, Everett, uh, Henry, Gronkowski, uh, rounds above him. I wouldn't have done that. Uh, uh, Jalen Hurts is a first quarterback. Uh, I wouldn't have done that. I think he saved himself um, as he put together this squad later. And Elijah Moore in this format, I'm going to live with that. I'm going to think Elijah's going to play very, very well uh, as we get to the, the end of the season. And then finally, he did what I like to do in drafts in the middle part. I, I thought he might have done it back to back, but uh, uh, this uh, this group let him do it, and I would have never let him do it. Was was to put Etienne and Robinson on the same team? Yeah, we we haven't seen that a whole lot, but we do see it tonight from Michael Cobb locking up that Jags running attack, a rushing attack. Dan Williamson from the Goat District podcast. He ends up getting Tom Brady and Justin Fields as his quarterbacks. Running backs, Dalvin Cook, Daryl Henderson, A.J. Dillon, Leonard Fournette, and Samaj P. Ryan. Receivers, A.J. Brown, Keenan Allen, Tyler Lockett, Jerry Judy, Robbie Anderson, Terrace Marshall, Mark Cazelda, Scantling, Dwayne Eskridge, and the tight ends, Hunter Henry, Rob Gronkowski, and Hayden Hurst. He gets late. Farrell, I think, you know, he did a really good job at tight end for not taking one in the first 11 rounds. Love the quarterbacks on this squad. It was a very on-brand Dan Williamson draft. He gets A.J. Mm-hmm. Brown early. He gets A.J. Dillon in the middle. Pounds the receivers pretty good in the first seven rounds. Really solid team. If the tight ends come together, it's going to be a competitive one and one that could challenge for the uh, title in this league. I think so, too, Balky. The change I would have made at tight end, he has Gronk already. Go ahead and put L.J. Howard there. He's likely to get a score from one of them from week to week. Um, Hayden Hurst is a nice uh, uh, experiment, uh, but I like it better. Um, I like it better if I have Pitts or I like it better a little later. I would have gone ahead and put Howard with Gronkowski and Henry. Hindsight is indeed 2020. We'll see what Dan Williamson says on the next GOAT District podcast about how this team came together, his regrets, and maybe his non-regrets. Let's go to Curtis Hirsch, 
who um, uh, selected Matthew Stafford and Tua Tunga Bailoa as quarterbacks from the three spot. It was Clyde Edwards Alaire, Michael Carter, Zach Moss, uh, Darrington Evans, and Kenneth Gainwell as his running backs. C.D. Lamb, Cooper Cup, Jamar Chase, Juju Smith Schuster, Devontae Parker, Jalen Rager, Emmanuel Sanders, and Marquez Calloway, along with Van Jefferson at receiver. Tight ends are Travis Kelsey and Gerald Everett. Um, I, I, I will say this. Um, this is a team that I think has a lot of firepower, but I also think, Farrell, that he didn't necessarily need to go so heavy with the receivers from round 10 on, given how hard he hit them in rounds three through six. So the receivers are insanely deep, fine with the quarterbacks. Tight ends are great, but the running backs paid the price for all those extra receivers being drafted. We talked about it yesterday. Sometimes when you get in a mode of drafting it, heavy at one position, you can't get out of it. I don't necessarily like Rager with where he got him. Some receivers could have helped, or some running backs could have helped him there. Uh, he did a lot of good things, a lot of good players. Evans and Gainwell, where he took them, I would have preferred running backs uh, after uh, I know he could not have got Lindsay. I wonder if he thought Lindsay was going to fall to him. Uh, 14th round for Philip Lindsay. Well, I guess we'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, I, I'm with you, Balky. Uh, excellent receivers at the expense of the running back position. Let's move on and talk about team number four here. John Paulson from 4for4.com. I uh, got a chance to catch up with him. Here's how his team ended up Ryan Tannehill, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Jameis Winston at quarterback. Running backs Alvin Kamara, Joe Mixon. Tony Pollard, Latavius Murray, and Devontae Booker at running back. Uh, receivers are Terry McLaurin, Deontay Johnson, Chase Claypool, Tyler Boyd, Curtis Samuel, Traquan Smith, and John Brown. Tight ends TJ Hawkinson, Eric Ebron, and Mo Ali Cox. So he kind of took us through his thought process on, on this one. He gets the, the stack of, of McLaurin, Samuel, and Ryan Fitzpatrick. He also um, ends up getting um, – uh, Camara with the four pick, which I thought was pretty good. And he backs him up with Latavius Murray as well. Good stuff there. I think that as I look at this squad, there's not a whole lot. Um, I, I don't know if I would have done differently. Um, you could you could make the argument that maybe his, his number three running back is weak. Um, but obviously, if Elliott goes down, he's elite at the position. Um, and then the, the tight end up. You know, Hockett to the tight end six is great. I don't know if I would have waited until round 14 to grab Ebron, but you got to be, I said this every night, you got to be weak somewhere. And certainly I think John Paulson left himself weak at a spot that may not be the worst thing in the world for his success in this draft. Yeah, I think he's got enough at Hawkinson based on who uh, the firepower he has at the other positions. I like what he did with the stacking. This would be our friends, um, uh, Reed and, and uh, Connor from uh, chasing the helmet. They would, this would be their favorite team is that they live for the stacking. And uh, Tannehill continues to grow, in my eyes, especially in this format. There's an eighth-round quarterback, unlike Jalen Hurts, who will possibly flirt with 40 touchdowns, and I like that situation. We like that situation for John Paulson. Let's see uh, how much we like the situation for team number five. That's Alex Palazzo, as he gets Josh Allen, Baker Mayfield as his quarterback's Derek Henry, Najee Harris, J.K. Dobbins, Trey Sermon, Gus Edwards, Philip Lindsay, and Damian Williams at running back. The receivers are Chris Godwin, LaVisca Chenault, Michael Pittman, Russell Gage, Gabriel Davis, Nico Collins, tight ends Tyler Higby, O.J. Howard, and Dan Arnold. So for a guy who really struggled or, you know, said he struggled with, with this draft, getting sniped back and forth, obviously did an awesome job at, at running back. I think the quarterbacks are great as well. Not sure how much I love O.J. Howard as my number two tight end when Higby's my number one. But I think the problem is, is the receiving core uh, on Belazzo's team. Chris Godwin, sure. LaVisca Chenault is your number two. I, I think I said this last night. Not a huge fan of it. Now, Pittman is your three I can get on board with. And then after that, um, you, you see Russell Gage. I think you and I are of the same mind on Gabriel Davis with the Manny Sanders factor in, in Buffalo. Nico Collins could be great, but it's a 17th-round wild card. So the receivers have to come through here for Belazzo. Because everyone else should. I think Pittman will prove to be his number two producer at the wide receiver, which may cause him a problem. But you know, he when he hits home runs, he hits some long ones. Uh, Philip Lindsay is is a is a big long home run here in the fourteenth round. Uh, you know, I'm I'm all in on Higby this year after being somewhat indifferent to him last year. Uh, yeah, this. Uh, 
this team uh, will be the one that was maybe if they don't deliver here, I would say with one or two picks away from uh, having a different story. And uh, Belazzo will tell you, like, look, if you guys would have put me in pros versus Joes before, I, I probably would have put together a dominant team here. Instead, I had to put up with this you-know-what <laughs> show, and uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll see what happens with Belazzo there. Well, yeah, as you, we feel move that forward. Way. You, you feel that way, Balky, sometimes when you're drafting in the middle. That's why I never particularly care for the middle. I'm always shocked when things work out for me and something falls my way in the middle, and I think that's what he meant by that. Yeah, he did. I, I, I think you're you're totally out, uh, totally totally right on on that. Let's move on and talk about Team Six, who was right next to Belazzo, who actually uh, sniped him a few times. It's established the run. dot com's Pat Foreman. Uh, quarterbacks ended up being Russell Wilson and Daniel Jones. Running backs: Ezekiel Elliott, Antonio Gibson, James Conner, Giovanni Bernard, and Xavier Jones. Receivers: Robert Woods, Adam Thielen, Kenny Galladay, Brandon Cooks, Will Fuller, Darnell Mooney, AJ Green, Alan Lazard, and Deshaun Jackson. Tight ends are Kyle Pitts and Blake Jarwin. Farrell, I love the, the the receiver value that he got, you know, basically throughout the draft, starting with round four. A lot of good players fell to him, and he made sure he scooped them up and did not let Belazzo or Andrew Miller grab them. So great job on the receivers there. Love the quarterbacks. I think the tight ends are going to be really good, too, with Pitts and Jarwin. Um, the running back depth is, is, is a little bit of a question mark here. You get Elliott and Gibson in the first two rounds. Yeah, that covers up a lot of warts, but James Conner's yep. your three. Uh, Giovanni Bernard is, is your four. He might be the number four running back in Tampa. And then uh, you have uh, Xavier Jones. Who knows what we're going to get with that. So, uh, you know, again, you, you, if, you, if he hits on one of these running backs and, and maybe Chase Edmonds or, goes down or Ronald Jones or Fournette, yeah, he's going to be looking real good. Um, the question is how do you sort of keep your head above water until then the receivers are going to have to carry the, carry the water here. I think he took the position that if something happens to Elliott, or if something happens to Gibson, I'm not going to win this thing anyway. So I'm going to take these two guys, right. and I'm going to go from there. Now, he, he has Donald Jones, and I, and I would have loved to have seen him draft uh, Kadarius Toney, other than one of the one of the two aging uh, wide receivers here. I think I'm correct in saying that Tony again, uh, does not get drafted in this one, and I think that's a mistake. Yeah, I, I, I hope it's a mistake. God, I got so much Kadarius Toney. Uh, in my in my dynasty leagues this year, that that I, I hope this guy ends up panning out because otherwise, uh, to quote uh, Job from uh, Rest of Development, I've made a terrible mistake. Let's move on and talk about Andrew Miller's team here from the seven spot. The FFPC longtime FFPC Joe drafting seventh tonight. He ends up with Kyler Murray, Trey Lance, and Taysom Hill as his quarterbacks. As we look forward to his running backs, it's Miles Sanders, Damian Harris, Ronald Jones. James White, and Daryl Williams. Receivers, DeAndre Hopkins, Allen Robinson, Brandon Ayuk, Debo Samuel, Jarvis Landry, uh, Christian Kirk, Brian Edwards, and Sammy Watkins. Uh, you're looking at the tight ends of Darren Waller and Cole Komet. I really like those tight ends. Now, the, the quarterbacks, Murray and Lance, yeah, I, I see the talent there. And, in fact, if Lance does start earlier rather than later, which we don't know what's going to happen there, based, uh, according to what Kyle Shanahan said today, he does have Samuel and Ayuk on this team, a Niners receiver quarterback stack, uh, and he also got the stack with Murray and Hopkins. So Miller was all about that stack uh, tonight in the draft. Um, running backs, you know, Sanders and Harris are good. Jones, White, Darrell Williams, I don't know. I mean, I, I think you're seeing that some teams in the middle of the draft here kind of, I don't want to say ignore the running back position, but you can see that they did not emphasize it. And Andrew Miller is really good everywhere else. But, again, the running backs have to come through if he's going to somehow take down this league for a main event team next year. And I think they will. I think Ronald Jones will do very, very well at Tampa. That team's actually going to be better uh, than they were last year. And if that's the case, that supports two running backs. So we're, it, it doesn't matter what Fournette does. Jones is looking at a good year to me. So I think he's doing okay here to get a 1,000-yard rusher maybe 10 touchdowns in the ninth round. Michael Nazareth from Fantasy Football Mastermind, a guy who's been on our show a bunch, and who's also had a bunch of success in the pros versus Joe's format over uh, the last few years he's been in it. Uh, Nazareth ends up with a squad tonight featuring Aaron Rodgers, Kirk Cousins, and Zach Wilson at quarterback. The running backs are Austin Eckler, Chris Carson, Miles Gaskin, Naheem Hines, Rashad Penny, and Tariq Cohen. Running uh, Receivers, Calvin Ridley, Mike Evans, Antonio Brown, Jalen Waddell, Marvin Jones, and Tyrell Williams. 
tight end, Logan Thomas, Robert Tunyon, and Jared Cook. Farrell, this is another team that, and you can tell Michael Nazrick not only plays in pros versus Joes, but he plays in the FFPC main event. He's won main event leagues out there. You can tell this has the, the, the markings of a, of a high-stakes draft or uh, put it, you know, going to work here. Getting Chris Carson and Rashad Penny locked up. Taking advantage of the value on Miles Gaskin as the number three receiver. Getting a player like Antonio Brown in round eight. Getting another player who fell to round 10 tonight, Robert Tunyon. Uh, I love the Marvin Jones and Jared Cook picks in round 13 and 14. And you and I are of the same mind. Tyrell Williams is a good pick in the round 17 tonight, too. So I really like Nazarek's squad. Uh, and I know he was in the YouTube chat tonight touting his own team. But, man, go ahead and toot your own horn, Mike. You did a good job tonight. I think you got something to brag about here. And Tanya gets his quarterback uh, back and then falls in the draft. That's an unusual uh, correlation there. Antonio Brown is a huge pickup here. All these uh, wide receivers that started in the eighth round that he put together, he's got some of my favorite guys. I don't think he missed on one of them. We talked about Cohen. Uh, okay, I can live with it at, at this 15th round. And, and finally, someone drafts Zach Wilson, so good for him. Good for him, indeed. Maybe we'll get Nazareth back on the HSFF Hour to talk a little bit about uh, how we put this uh, together from uh, ffmastermind.com. Nick Thompson, we got a chance to catch up with him tonight. He ends up getting Dak Prescott, Trevor Lawrence, and Matt Ryan as his quarterbacks. The running backs are Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, Josh Jacobs, Devin Singletary, Receivers Tyree Kill, Amari Cooper, Cortland Sutton, Sutton, beg your pardon, Michael Gallup, Marquise Brown, Cole Beasley, and Diami Brown. Tight ends Evan Ingram, Austin Hooper, Zach Ertz, and Dawson Knox. Farrell, I, we talked about the running backs. They're, they're fantastic to get Josh Jacobs in the sixth round. Uh, one of the steals of the draft. I love the quarterbacks. I think the receivers are really good. You, you have that Cowboys Uber stack there as well. Um, and, and I think that the thing that you needed to do if you're Nick Thompson is fire a lot of bullets at that tight end position, which he did starting in round 10 on. Now, none of those guys are going to be great, I don't think, Engram, Hooper, Ertz, Knox, but you'd like to think dedicating four roster spots to that position, hopefully that's enough to keep this team among the leaders throughout the season. Uh, yeah, Zach Ertz is late. I, I guess Zach Ertz is, is the best upside uh, of these guys, he takes Dawson Knox as well. Ertz was uh, occasionally talked about destination Buffalo, but I think that's over with. Uh, yeah, I would have, I would have liked to uh, when he took uh, when he when he took Ingram. He could have had Tunyon. I would have preferred Tunyon. Uh, I think I would have too, actually, um, there. Uh, Tunyon continues to fall um, in, in drafts, and this is after the Rodgers news today. Uh, surprising to see there. Let's move on to Jeff Manns from GuruElite.com. He ended up with uh, Justin Herbert, Deshaun Watson, and Sam Darnold as his quarterbacks. Uh, went running back heavy early. Nick Chubb, Mike Davis, Javante Williams, Kareem Hunt, and then gets Tevin Coleman late. Receivers, Devontae Adams, DJ Chark, Nicole Hardman, Henry Ruggs, T.Y. Hilton, Rashad Perriman, Paris Campbell, and Denzel Mims. Uh, tight ends are Noah Fant, Mike Gesicki uh, on this squad. So the tight ends are, are, are fine. The running backs among the best in the league, maybe the best in the league here for Jeff Mann. Clear what his idea was going in. He got the, the target hog in Adams. He gets all the volume guys and the running backs in the first five rounds. And then you you, you got to focus on the receivers after that, and maybe they'll pan out because he's got a lot of explosive guys down there, a lot of guys with some speed, Hardman and Ruggs. Obviously, Perriman can burn too. Uh, T.Y. Hilton and Paris Campbell, you'd like to believe that one of those guys is going to be pretty impactful for the Colts this year. That's that's where the, the issue will, will lie on this team, is if those receivers that he collected there in rounds 10 through uh, 14 – come through. This is going to be a really good team with all those touches in the backfield. And obviously Adams, Fant, and Gesicki manning the number one, uh, number, number one receiver, number one tight end, and number two tight end positions on the squad. Yeah, and I, and I like all his receivers that he took after Hardman better than I like Hardman. And Rubs is the potential <laughs> there for breakout. And that that is the cheapest stack. That's the cheapest receiver stack that could return the most uh, is, is at the Indianapolis Colts. I would prefer if he had somehow got Pittman in this group. But nevertheless, this is a very, very good team. Um, uh, congratulations on putting this together. And I'll talk about Tevin Coleman. Everybody 
wants to give me an earful about Tevin Coleman, what he hasn't been able to do with the 49ers. And Tevin Coleman is coming towards the end of his career. But remember, there was a reason that the people from San Francisco, when they took the job, and they're, they're, they're very good football people, when they took the job in New York, that they allowed this player to come with them via free agency. So I'm, I'm willing to say that Kevin Coleman will have a chance. I don't want to spend a lot for him in the draft, but 15 makes it easy to take a shot on Kevin Coleman. Yeah, I'm definitely with you when you talk about the draft capital. I'm, I'm fine with Kevin Coleman in the 15th round. I think he's a lot better than a lot of the other 15th round selections that you will see in drafts like this. Uh, just shout out to Jerry Boone, the FFPC Joe selecting 11th tonight. The team ended up being Patrick Mahomes, Derek Carr, and Jared Goff at quarterback. Uh, running backs, Saquon Barkley, Chase Edmonds, Melvin Gordon, Jamal Williams, Alexander Madison, and Malcolm Brown. Receivers, Julio Jones, Odell Beckham, Mike Williams, Corey Davis, Nelson Aguilar, and Sterling Shepard. Tight ends are George Kittle, Irv Smith, and Anthony Ferkser. When you go with an early tight end and an early quarterback, um, sometimes the depth can suffer. So while Jared Boone's team here is, is clearly elite at, at both quarterback and tight end, uh, I don't know if the depth is there at the uh, running back and receiver positions. Certainly Williams and Madison should have some good games as, as the lead guys if their starters go down. Melvin Gordon is, is going to be splitting time, so I think the running back position uh, was, was uh, correctly um, adhered to there or attended to there. And then the receivers, too. I mean, Jones and Beckham in, in the uh, fourth and fifth round, yeah, that, that's great. Uh, but Mike Williams, Corey Davis, Aguilar, Shepard after that, is it enough, Farrell? Is it enough to make this team a first-place team? Some things I think he could have done differently would be to uh, replace Madison uh, with either Lindsay or uh, James White because you're betting on the fact that, that your your player is going to play um, his standalone value is not strong enough to overcome what we think about those players. And then uh, his receivers are strong. Uh, Ferkser, I'm going to have to say this is where I'm comfortable with Ferkser. I, oh, okay. I've, uh, I, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead and say, and I wouldn't have drafted him, but I'm comfortable drafting him here. Sterling Shepard is underrated, but will score. Uh, you know, we know what we're going to get from him, 65 catches a year, and it, it's not – overwhelmingly uh, and not overwhelmingly producing points, but he will score in a couple games. So I'm okay with that. This is, uh, I probably would have taken another dart. He's got one too many quarterbacks here. Um, and I probably would have thrown another dart at a, at a wide receiver here. Uh, Curtis Patrick from Rotoviz and Ryan McDowell from Dynasty League Football, bringing websites and championship pros versus shows teams together or at least that's the attempt they're doing from the 12 spot tonight. Lamar Jackson and Joe Burrow at quarterback. Jonathan Taylor, Raheem Mostert, David Johnson, J.D. McKissick, and J.B. and Hawkins at running back. The receivers are Stephon Diggs, D.J. Moore, T. Higgins, Devontae Smith, Rondale Moore, Rashad Bateman, Jamison Crowder, and Jacoby Myers. The tight ends are Mark Andrews, Johnny Smith, and Dalton Schultz. I don't know the – I know both Patrick and McDowell play Dynasty, but – McDowell is wearing the DLF patch on this team. I don't know if rookie fever hit this team, Farrell. Mm -hmm. We see Devontae Smith. We see Rondale Moore. We see Rashad Bateman, uh, J.B. and Hawkins late. A lot of rookies on this team. And I don't know if the uh, the running backs, to me, are not deep enough. Raheem Mostert is okay as your number two, but you've got to have somebody after that. And I don't know if David Johnson, McKissick, and Hawkins are the answer. A lot of receivers, that will help them. Mark Andrews early, yeah. Uh, John Lee Smith in the middle, sure. Dalton Schultz late, ah, uh, we'll see. And the quarterbacks are great, um, but this team is, is another one. There's a lot of haves and have-nots at the receiver and running back position, as there are in a lot of pros versus Joe's draft. This is a team that has the receivers. I think it's a have-not for the running backs. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And his late receivers... I don't think they were necessary. Crowder and Myers, I don't see those guys doing much for him. Um, perhaps if I took Taylor in a format like this, I would want to run maybe as much as two more of those uh, Indianapolis Colts running backs uh, to go along with Taylor, and I might pay up for them um, to, to get them. David Johnson, I would have felt much better about it 
if if he had stacked Lindsey with Johnson, Rondell Moore, I absolutely love. He's going to be an exciting player, and he's going to score more for him at the end of the year uh, than he will earlier in the year. But with a player like Moore, I don't think he needed Crowder. Uh, McKissick, um, uh, there's there's uh, there's some upside to McKissick. We talked about him. Uh, what I think is he's a new age Danny Woodhead. I think he's still uh, developing as a player. Uh, he's been in the league a while, but he played very well last year. I expect him to continue his uh, his progress as an NFL player in the small package. I love that number 41. Just absolutely love it. And we love all 84 teams that drafted in the Pros versus Joes competition this year. Once again, we covered uh, six of those drafts on the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour uh, the other slow draft, uh, again, we'll try to bring some exposure to it because I would like to get into that draft a little bit, maybe in a future episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour. But uh, that brings us to an end for our live draft coverage. Now that you have seen what the pros and the high stakes FFPC Joes are doing, you want to put that to work, go to myffpc.com. You can sign up for a league as low as $5 there, or you can always go to kffsc.com, which happens to be the uh, commissioned by my co-host, Farrell Elliott, the definitive commissioner of fantasy football. That's over at KFFSC.com. Main event leagues filling up both online and live in Cincinnati, live in Louisville. Can't wait to do that. For more information, go to KFFSC.com or give Farrell a buzz, 502-523-5057. Farrell, it was a pleasure doing these drafts for you. We'll, uh, we'll go back to more of our standard format on Friday night. Have a great night, my man. This was awesome. Thank you, Rocky. Same here. Beryl Elliott, ladies and gentlemen, as we sign off to him, uh, we will uh, just give you a, a little bit of an update uh, here as far as what's going on with the FFPC. Now, uh, the main event is still going strong. The early draft slot announcement will come out on August 1st, and if you are already in that early draft slot announcement and you want to pick up another team, go to myffpc.com. You'll get $400 off each additional main event team whether you're drafting live in Las Vegas at Planet Hollywood or from the comfort of your own home. Online drafts for the Football Guys Players Championship continue to fill up faster than ever. So you want to take a shot at a half million bucks and you only want to invest $350 into it, hey, go ahead and do it over at myffpc.com. I believe all the drafts are now filled for tonight. We will get back on board with the Football Guys Players Championship beginning at 4 o'clock tomorrow. Two left in the latest two-hour slow draft for the Football Guys Players Championships. You can sign up for that there. And don't forget about the inaugural Best Ball Tournament, $125 entry, $100,000 grand prize in a half-million-dollar prize pool. Do want to uh, go ahead and uh, send out some thank yous uh, to everybody who made the pros versus Joes possible. Number one, the pros and Joes that participated. Obviously, the callers that we had tonight, our guests were Alex Palazzo, Nick Thompson, Dan Williamson, and John Paulson. Great to talk to those guys getting their minds about how the draft went for them. I uh, do want to uh, thank Darren Armani for putting this together at Fantasy Mojo on Twitter, FantasyMojo.com, the godfather of the pros versus shows. This does not happen unless Darren Armani puts it together. I uh, want to remind you, if you want to get involved into some uh, Dynasty Fantasy football, MyFFPC.com is where to go there. Dynasty startups beginning at just $77 there. Uh, so make sure you're taking advantage. Want to thank our producer and mutual friend Rob, audio engineer, my best friend Bryce, and of course the people I really want to thank, the listeners, all of you who are hanging out over the last two weeks with us on these two-hour broadcast live draft coverage. We might have another live draft left in us. We'll tell you more about that coming up as the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour rolls on. We'll be back 10, 9 Central Friday. It's going to be another good show. We hope you hop on board for that as well. Thanks so much, everybody. Your weekend officially. This has been another episode of the High Stakes Fantasy Football Hour, presented by MyFFPC.com. It was broadcast live and heard around the world. Balky and Farrell will be back next week with more analysis, interviews, and advice from guests much smarter than they are. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk with you again next week.
We do have some great guests lined up for you as we hit peak drafting season uh, here, everybody. This, I mean, the main event drafts for the FFPC are still are already going on. Football Guys Players Championship picking up a lot of steam right now, and obviously the inaugural best ball tournament. Just think, I mean, you know, Cincinnati will be live for the KFFSC in just a few weeks here. Um, a week after that, you're going to have uh, Louisville, Hummin, the Labor Day Draftathon after that, and then, of course, all our live events out in Las Vegas. Not that far away. If you have not jumped into a draft, I would encourage you to do so right now. Take advantage um, and, and start collecting your guys, getting your guys on all these squads, and start dominating and make 2021 a year to remember for fantasy football. Appreciate all of you listening. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you on Friday night.